for 100. Lad off Chevrolet. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat told his parliament that. Charles Champlin. Hello, the Sinai. We resume. Yes, indeed. Tonight's the night. We begin a new season of memory movies every Saturday night in the new uh, auditorium at Northwest Federal's Community Center over on Irving Park Road, just uh, west of Cicero, 4901 West Irving Park Road. Brand new season. We have a uh, fantastic <laughs> and tonight. It's our premiere for 1978. We have Animal Crackers from 1930, starring the Marx Brothers. There's four of them here: Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo. And of course, the ever popular <laughs> Margaret Dumont. Comedy entertainment worthy of your attention, and you'll see it tonight on the big screen in the beautiful, comfortable new auditorium in the Northwest Community Center. If you've ever been to one of our um, our movies in the past, uh, you'll know um, what a good time we've had, and you also know that we've often had cramped quarters and uh, 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 sometimes hard to see screen. But that is all gone. We have a beautiful, comfortable uh, theater type auditorium with 300 uh, theater seats, a large screen on a beautiful stage, a sloped floor. Very high ceiling, a beautiful um, ventilation, <laughs> heating and air conditioning, whichever the weather happens to be outside, we use the opposite inside, and um, I think you're going to like it. A refreshment counter for some goodies and uh, a beautiful, uh, beautiful time to be had. We'll be there tonight, and we hope you'll join us, too, for the um, uh, memory movie premiere tonight, Animal Crackers from 1930. Doors open at 730 our program begins at 8 o'clock. We'll have a Lucky Strike Extra, a little extra short subject. Oh, we have a beauty for you tonight, too. Can't tell you. Won't know about that till later on. Why don't you come see our new Clyde B. Reed Auditorium at the Northwest Community Center, 4901 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. You want to see it, you can t park in the parking lot at the rear of the building and then go right into the uh, community center because the entrance is at the rear of the building by the parking lot. If you take the CTA bus, uh, you go to um, Le Mans and Irving, and then you walk south along side of the building and then west to the back, and you'll be right into the auditorium. A nice, nice place to be. So we hope you'll be there tonight for our premiere for the new season, Animal Crackers with the Marx Brothers. Got to see that. Got to see it. We'll have more about that a little later on, too. This is Chuck Shaden on WNIB Chicago, FM 97. Our Those Were the Days program. A lot of... Uh, various radio programs throughout the afternoon. For the first one, we're going back to January 28th of 1947. The um, National Broadcasting Company was the vehicle uh, for transmitting this program to your airwaves. The sponsor was Raleigh Cigarettes. We've left the uh, cigarette commercials intact for historical reference. This is where they talk about the, the 903 Raleigh's where they've uh, moisturized the tobacco and they go whoosh. It's moisturized. Red Skelton uh, is uh, Willie Lump Lump in this, and Junior the Mean Widow Kid, and all of the regulars are on this too. Verna Felton, Pat McGee, Wonderful Smith. <laughs> wonderful name, Wonderful Smith. Anita Ellis, David Forrester in the orchestra, Gigi Pearson, and um, I think Rod O'Connor too, the announcer on this. Let's tune in to the Red Skelton Show. <laughs> It's moisturized, the new, all-new Raleigh 903 cigarette. Listen. <whistles> that jet of fresh, pure moisture stands for the new, different, moisturized Raleigh 903. New blend, new taste, new freshness. It's the new, all-new, moisturized Raleigh 903. program starring Red Skelton with David Forrester and his orchestra, our singing star Anita Ellis, Gigi Pearson, Verna Felton, Pat McGee, and wonderful Smith, and yours truly, Rod O'Connor. Easy. <laughs> it's a pleasure to bring you Metro Golden Mayor's popular comedian and the star of the Raleigh Cigarette Program, Red Skelton. Thank you very much.
much. Evening, folks. How are you? 903, Ron. 903, Red. Yeah. I sound like Kate Kaiser. You Hello. sure do. Yes, you do. <laughs> Say, Red, have you noticed that Bob Hope's guests recently have all been Raleigh smokers? Tonight it was Ben Hogan, the golf champ, and last Tuesday he had Doug Fairbanks Jr., whose favorite brand is Raleigh. Yeah, did you hear Hope say he always leaves me holding the bag? Yeah, I heard him. <laughs> yeah, but those are not golf balls in it, them zig. <laughs> Is that his golf score? <laughs> well, gee, I had a lot of fun. That's yours now. You can pick it up. Yourself. Okay, swell. Did you lose your place, or are you just going to ignore me tonight? <laughs> uh, say, Red, I hear you were up north. Uh, how'd you find San Francisco? Oh, I just switched on the fog lights, and there it was. <laughs> Well, Red, is all this talk about the San Francisco fog true? No, during uh, the time I was there, I didn't see any fog at all. You didn't? No, the weather wasn't clear enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't have to happen to stop at Alcatraz, did you? No, our class doesn't hold its reunion till next spring. <laughs> well, where else did you go? Went down and had dinner at the Fisherman's Wharf. What'd you have? Huh? What'd you have? <laughs> An omelet. <laughs> Hey, I went fishing. I went fishing. I caught a little fish about an inch long. See? What'd you do with it? Fried it over a pilot light. <laughs> <laughs> well, say, Red, did you see Earl Wilson's column in the Daily News mm -hmm. last Thursday? Yeah. He's very nice to you. Yes, he was. And it was a swell write up. You know, Earl's been my favorite columnist. Since when? Since last Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> hey, on the train, I read Earl Wilson's latest book, Pike's Peak or Bush. You know, I'd enjoyed the book more, but the guy next to me kept reading right along with me. Gee, that always irritates me when some nosy guy reads over my shoulder. That's the way the guy beside me felt, too. <laughs> hey, did you ever ride on a bus or a streetcar and have people look over your shoulder and read out of your paper? I don't mind that, but when they start cutting out clippings, I... <laughs> hey, you know, Pike Speaker Bus is really a, is a swell book. It's funny and it's clean. It's so clean. In fact, it's the first book that Boston has read in five years. <laughs> Well, does it give the inside dope on a lot of celebrities? Yeah, it gives a lot of inside dope on a lot of inside dope. <laughs> <laughs> no, all in all, it's really a good book, and it's written by a great newspaper man who always can see good in his fellow man, and that's Earl Wilson. <laughs> That jet of fresh, pure moisture stands for the new, all-new, Rolly 903 cigarette. It's moisturized to stay fresh longer. It's moisturized to taste better. It's moisturized to smoke milder. Yes, this new Rolly 903 is moisturized by the revolutionary new 903 process. That fresh, clean, beneficial moisture penetrates every leaf, every fiber of Rolly's choice tobaccos, brings you new mellow taste, New mildness, new freshness. It's the new, all new, Raleigh 903. And remember this about the new Raleigh 903. Medical science offers proof positive. No other leading cigarette gives you less nicotine, less throat irritating tars. Smokers, follow the example of that beautiful star, Paulette Goddard. Smoke this new Raleigh 903. New blend, new freshness, new taste. You'll see the number 903 on the government stamp. This Raleigh 903 is new. All new. Smoke the new, all new, Rolly 903. It's moisturized. Anita Ellis sings, Guilty. What'd you do? <laughs> Is it a sin? Is it a crime loving you dear like I do? If it's a crime, then I'm guilty, guilty of loving you. Maybe I'm wrong, dreaming of you. I'll always 
Thank you, says Red, to Anita Ellis on the Red Skelton Show from January 28th of uh, 1947. We'll get back to that in just a little bit. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program, WNIB Chicago, FM 97, every Saturday afternoon from 1 until 5. A hey, look back at the good old days of radio with all the good sounds from, from the past. Well, we have good news for you now from the Metro Golden Memory Shop. This is, uh, this is a very special announcement. I think we need... Uh, I think we need a fanfare, so let's uh, let's get the big orchestra in here and have a. Uh, are you fellas all set? Let's get a little fanfare, please. Uh, well, that was that was that was all right. I, I this is pretty big news. I think uh, uh, we got to let, let's hit it again, huh? That's, um, you know, this is really spectacular news. I think we need a, an even uh, more important fanfare than that. Uh, give us a, uh, this is a very big thing for the MGM shop today, and I want you to, uh, uh, let's, re let's uh, bring in the whole, the full thing. Everybody use it. Now hit it. That's more like it. Now, and here's the announcement. You can save 10% or more on anything in our store. That's right. It's the MGM Shop Special Discount Sale. And if you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop between now, today, January 21st, and January 31st, you'll find some good old savings along with all the good old memories we have for you. Everything and I mean everything in our shop has been reduced by 10% or more for this special sale. And that means you can save a big 10% on all of the records that we have in shop, the big band records, the old-time radio records, the personality recordings, also 10% on all of our cassettes. The only cassette you won't save on is our current cassette of the month. That's already at a pretty good value for $5. But all of the other cassettes that we have, the $6 cassettes, 10% uh, off, so it's uh, 60 cents off of those. All of the eight-track tapes we have of the old-time radio shows and the cassettes of the old-time radio shows, all of the books, many of which already have special prices on, add 10% to that. Magazines, cards, gifts, and novelties, that old-time radio music box, save 10% on it. At our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Now, there's even more than that. You can save more than 10% on some special items at the shop. For example, you can get a 25% discount on all of those fabulous nostalgic jigsaw puzzles that we have in shop. Puzzles of, uh, of the Marx Brothers, Clark Gable, Marilyn Monroe, Humphrey Bogart, those vintage automobile puzzles that we have, puzzles shaped like a, a, a uh, or that look like they're in a box shaped like an old-time radio and in a camera, uh, an old brownie camera. All of those things, 25% on all jigsaw puzzles. We even have a number of, um, uh, s what is it, the $6 million man games, those half price on those, 50% uh, off of those. And the supply of those, um, you know, the original Armed Forces radio transcription disc, you hear us play these many times on the air here. Well, we have a supply of the large 16-inch records, the discs. You can save 50% on those during this special January discount sale. Uh, regularly sell for five dollars each. They're yours for only two fifty, and won't one of those radio transcriptions look good on the wall of your rec room? Hmm? You'll have lots of fun, and you'll save lots of loot when you shop our special discount sale now through January 31st at the Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. We're open every day, Monday through Friday, from 11 a.m. to 5:30 p.m. Saturday today from 10 a.m to 7.30 p.m. We're open right now. In fact, if you're coming to the uh, memory movie tonight, I get a little bit of an early start and swing by the shop and take advantage of the 10% and more discount. Uh, tomorrow, Sunday afternoon, you can stop by, too, from noon until 5, and we'll be there tomorrow afternoon, too. So if you are planning on coming over, why don't you stop in and say hello 
and uh, we'll show you where you can save all the 10% on all of the things. Everything, everything in the shop except the cash register, two clerks, and myself. <laughs> Every item uh, in the store uh, on sale. 10% or more, including many super discount specials. So come on in and save your Master Charge, Visa, or Bank America card is welcome at our Metro Golden Memory, 5941 West Irving Park Road. By the way, we're going to, we are having a drawing. Uh, we're going to give away 10 $10 MGM Shop gift certificates. So if you come in, whether you buy anything or not, just put your name and address on a little slip of paper that we have for you and you might win a $10 gift certificate. We have 10 of those. We'll have the drawing on the 1st of February. And also, if that isn't enough, you stop by. We have a copy of our Nostalgia Party Planner for you. It's a nice little um, uh, booklet that gives you all kinds of ideas uh, for a party, whether it's a Roaring Twenties party or a Frantic Forties, Hard Time Thirties, or a Fabulous Fifties party. Tell you how to have a good time with, uh, with all the things that you might be able to do at a party like that. So stop them. You can get that free. Register for the... Um, uh, the $10 gift certificate, and you might even pick up a couple of things at a good price. Our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road. Come on in today or tomorrow, next week for sure, until January 31st, 10% or more on anything in our store. A little longer message, but uh, one that we want to get across because we'd love to have you stop by and see all the goodies that we have. Now let's go back to January 28th of 1947, almost precisely 31 years ago, a week short of 31 years, uh, for the next segment of the Red Skelton Show. Tonight the stories and poems from our Skelton scrapbook of satire will be on jealousy. Good evening. My name is Jealousy. I am a professor in your school of thought. I teach four subjects. Envy. Resentment toward and fear of rivalry. Insistence on exclusive ownership. Skepticism of all but one's personal action. When I have taught you how to be proficient in each subject, you will receive your diploma of unhappiness. Chapter One, Fear of Rival. <laughs> My name's Willie Lumpjack. <laughs> There's never been a jealous bone in my head. Where in my head? My first <laughs> My first association with jealousy came about when I was born. My mother was jealous of other mothers. <laughs> they had children. <laughs> I came from a pioneer family of no good. My great-great-grandfather came to America during the Revolution. And he was thrown out of the country during a party in Boston when he spiked the team. <laughs> As I said before, I have never been of a jealous nature. Or oh, I might resent what other people have, but I ain't jealous. <laughs> if you care to hear my sad story, Bub? Why, sure. Then lend me your ears. <laughs> you didn't have to hand them to me. Just <laughs> <listen>. <laughs> My trouble started one night at the club. It was a very classy joint. It was so exclusive, they threw the owner out three times. <laughs> I had just finished a glass of milk. I poured it into the cuspidor. <laughs> I have nothing against these Jersey highballs. As a rule, I never touch the stuff. But somebody dropped an olive in the glass and it told me it's what I usually ordered, but it was suffering with smog. <laughs> <laughs> well, I threatened the head waiter. I told he told me, and I quote. If you come behind this counter, he says, I'll crown you. <laughs> well, after the coronation... <laughs> I met an old friend of mine. Howdy, Willie. Well, as I live and breathe sin, sin. 
It's the late my old friend, Long Thompson. How you been, Lord? Well, howdy, Willie. Yeah. You're looking in a pinker condition. Yeah, and I got bloodshot eyes to match, too. <laughs> what you doing in town? Huh? Oh, I've got a new car, and I thought I'd go for a drive. You got a new car? Huh? I wouldn't have one. Just so they can charge you a lot more money, they've added a lot of useless accessories, like uh, wheels and brakes. <laughs> They're not like the old cars, you know. You aren't by any chance jealous because you don't have one. I wish you hadn't have said that. Why? Because it's the truth. <laughs> I've been driving that thing I got for years now. Well, what kind of car have you got? It's a 1928 one-door sedan. <laughs> Never heard of a one-door sedan. Who made it? A truck. <laughs> Some way inside, some wise guy wouldn't pull over. So I told him off after I pulled my head out of his taillight. <laughs> I said, you get out of that pool, that truck there, and I'll mess you up a bit. I said, well, sir, what do you think it is? A woman truck driver. Did you mess her up? The case comes up Thursday. <laughs> Well, it's good to see you. Uh, uh, what's that you have in your hand? Something for your wife? Yeah, it's a bunch of flowers for my wife. Gee, gee, gee. Some gall darnies they are. <laughs> but they're all withered up. Yeah, it's my fault that they're withered, you see. They, they were beautiful a few minutes ago, but I smelled them and I accidentally exhaled instead of in them. <laughs> well, where's the little woman now? Well, last time I saw her, she was going to a beauty shop trying to get that 1947 look about her. She's 47. She wants to look 19. <laughs> Say, uh, didn't she used to go with Mel Bernstein? Yeah. Why you mention him? Oh, no reason. Just happened to see him in town this afternoon. <laughs> Mel's in town? <laughs> well, what's the matter, Willie? Well, uh, I wonder if that's why she didn't get mad when I said I was going out tonight. Oh, now, don't go getting any silly ideas. You aren't jealous, are you? For me? No. I'll see you later. You are jealous. No, I always turn green at this time of the day. <laughs> Now, look, Willie, forget that guy. I'll admit he thinks he's quite a ladies' man, but believe me, he's his own worst enemy. Not while I'm alive. <laughs> well, I left the club and I drove home, stopping on the way to clean the telephone poles from my windshield wipers. All I could think of was Mel Bernstein. Mel Bernstein, louder and louder. It kept wrecking through my brain. And finally, I pulled up in front of my California home, a Quonset hut surrounded by good humor men and life folks. <laughs> there was a dim light <laughs> in my apartment, so I parked my car. <laughs> I parked on the right side of the street. <laughs> when you park between these studi bakers, it's pretty hard to tell. <laughs> well, I walked up the stairs and I walked in. I walked down the hall and suddenly I was in front of my apartment, the one with the eviction notice on the door. <laughs> Number 66. And then I heard voices in the apartment and something inside of me snapped. I swallowed my bubble gum. <laughs> Voices, someone said. Oh, I love you. I love you too, my dear. Let me take you away from this place. Sound like Chuck Boyer. <laughs> Suddenly, everything in front of me went black. Somebody hung a hat over the keyhole. <laughs> I tried to break down the door. I run and threw my body against it. And I backed up and I running through my body against the door. Open the door, I cried. Richard wasn't there, so it didn't open. <laughs> then like a madman, like a madman, I turned the door knob. It was unlocked all the time. <laughs> and 
now before me stood a terrified woman. And a horrified man stood by the window and then... My bubble gum popped and knocked me flat on the stove. I entered the room. A man came in after me. Mr. Lamplap, what happened? Ain't you been paying attention? <laughs> I caught this man talking to my wife. Oh, this ain't your wife. Ain't this apartment 66? No, this is six. Good heavens, my jealousy's making me see double again. <laughs> Listen. That jet of fresh, pure moisture stands for the new, all new, Rolly 903 cigarette. It's moisturized to stay fresh longer. It's moisturized to taste better. It's moisturized to smoke milder. Yes, this new moisturized Rolly 903 is unlike any Rolly cigarette you've ever smoked before. It's new, all new, new blend. New freshness, new taste. And remember this about the new Rawley 903. Medical science offers proof positive. Tests certified by a jury of 14 doctors based on a method used by the United States government prove that no other leading cigarette gives you less nicotine, less throat-irritating tars. Smoke the new, all-new Rawley 903. <whistles> it's moisturized. Well, that was a pretty good uh, fanfare, too, on that, uh, following that uh, Raleigh commercial there back in 1947. The Red Skelton Show on our Those Were the Days program today, WNIB Chicago, FM 97, an afternoon of good listening every Saturday from 1 to 5 here on WNIB. Back to Red in just a bit. At the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, 2924 Central Street in Evanston, they try their very best to find finer workmanship, finer leathers, and finer fit. At the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, they strive for quality, comfort, and reasonable prices, too, because they choose to care, and we hope you'll choose the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, 2924 Central Street in Evanston. James Shoefrieder and Matt Mason will do their very best to fit you properly at the Paul Meyer Shoe Store. Remember uh, cars with running boards and uh, rumble seats? I'm a little rumble seat in the back of the uh, the little coupe there, right along. Boy, guy and his gal sitting in the back out in the in the breeze under the moon. Nice, uh, nice night for a ride. Those things were standard equipment on a new Ford back in 1931. Running boards, that is, and the rumble seats. That's when Nelson Hirschberg Ford first put up their "We're in business to serve you" sign on Irving Park Road. In the 47 years since then. Running boards and rumble seats have become but a fond memory. But it's still fun to sit in the back seat of a Nelson Hirschberg Ford. They're still in the business of serving thousands of Chicagoland families with the bright new Fords at that same location, 5133 West Irving Park Road at Laramie. When you visit Nelson Hirschberg Ford, you'll discover what's made their business prosper all these years. You'll discover that Nelson Hirschberg Ford wants your business today and tomorrow, too. Nelson Hirschberg Ford, 5133 Irving Park Road, five blocks west of Cicero at Laramie. Now we go back to Red Skelton. David Forrester and his Raleigh Cigarette Orchestra play a waltz from Broadway's newest musical hit, Finian's Rainbow, and it's called When I'm Not Near the Girl I Love.
Chapter 2, Jealousy with Circumstantial Evidence and an Imagination. Junior got Grandpa in Dutch and his grandma in Jealousy's clutch. The result of his prattle was almost a battle, till he admitted he tattled too much. Oh, boy, look on the top shelf of that cupboard up there, cookie jar. That means there's a fresh supply of homemade manhole covers in there. <laughs> Maybe Grandma wouldn't mind if I took a few. Then again, she might get mad because she warned me about climbing up on this cupboard. She said I might fall out and hurt myself. I better not take any. Then on second thought, <laughs> may as well take a couple beans. I'm up here anyway, you know. <laughs> don't you? Yeah, well, don't yell. You scared me. Oh. You're in the cookie jar. How do you know? Me feet sticking out? <laughs> I told you about getting in that cookie jar. Yeah. Now get down from there. Okay, Joanna move. <laughs> Wait till I get the ladder. Well, I can't change my mind in midair, kiddo. <laughs> now I'll have to punish you for disobeying Well, now, if I'm going to put you through any trouble, kiddo, you... <laughs> oh, 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 you hit me. You hit me. You broke me when I'm back. You broke me back. You hit me, broke me, so will we act? You broke me, so will we act? Then why are you holding your head? Yep. Because I don't know where me so will we act is. <laughs> you hit me again, I'm going to tell on you, I will. You're going to tell what? I will tell everybody that you used to be Madame Muller, the woman heavyweight wrestler champion of the world. Junior, I was no such thing. Oh, no. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of this match is Atomic Annie. Sit fouls me! <laughs> She's doing it every time. She oh, I knew your father shouldn't have laughed when the stork knocked at the door and said, Trick or treat. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Grandma, did the stork bring me? Yes, I guess they were out of babies that day. Yeah. When I was your age, I didn't do things like you do. No, oh, backward child, huh? <laughs> You're getting too big for such tomfoolery. Uh -huh. I want you to take an oath that you won't cause any more havoc. Okay, I will give you me scout salute. <laughs> well, why are you holding your nose? I belong to the skunk patrol. <laughs> Don't be silly. Yeah. Repeat after me. Repeat after me. I, Junior. I, Junior, the widow whacked I had you. <laughs> You solemnly swear. You, oh, no, you don't. You ain't tricking me into a beating. No. I'm not swearing. I have two widows to swear. Come on, come on. Hmm? You solemnly swear that I will never again do another wrong deed. Well, say it. What are you waiting for? That I will never again do another wrong deed. <laughs> What was that explosion in the living room? There were some delayed action bombs in the goldfish bowl, I thought. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Junior. What? What have you got in your pocket? A pretty widow box. Let me see it. It fell out of Grandpa's, uh, Grandpa's uh, a hole in his pocket. Just... There wasn't a hole in his pocket last night. There is now. <laughs> Let's see. What is it? Oh, a wristwatch. A wristwatch? Junior. Was there a card with this? No, there wasn't, but Grandpa said something about it being for a lady named uh, Annie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're very ripe. You look green all of a sudden, Grandma. <laughs> hey, is that watch better than yours, Grandma? Well, look for yourself. This, is... this one has gold hands. This is yours. Mmm, these pan hands. Mm. <laughs> Junior, hmm? what does your grandfather usually do when he takes you for walk? Well, he puts me up on the ice cream counter and he says, you stay here, kiddo, I'll be right back. And then he goes next door to a sawmill. A sawmill? Yeah, I think so. There's a sawdust on the floor, anyhow. I know. <laughs> Maybe it's a music shop. Maybe it's a music shop. He says he's going in there to wet his, wet his whistle, and he does, too. Mm -hmm. he wet his whistle. How do you know, dear? Because I followed him, but they wouldn't let me in. They said, we don't allow minors in here. Well, I says, don't allow minors in here. Goodness me. Why you say that to me? I don't even know John L. Lewis. <laughs> but no self, they wouldn't let me in. Did you see your grandfather in that place? Yes, I peeked through the swinging doors, I did. Do they have waitresses in there? You mean girls that wait on tables? Yes. Little short uh, skirts and little white aprons? Yes. Red fingernails, long? Yes. No, I didn't see any of them. <laughs> no blondes? 
Blondes. Everybody talked about the blondes. Blondes, blondes. Don't the widow redheads and brunettes ever had no fun? Oh, Have you ever seen him, well, say, affectionate toward anyone? Well, now that you mention it, uh, yes. I see him once put his arms around Mabel's neck. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, I knew it. I noticed a sudden change in him, especially toward me. <laughs> What does Mabel look like? She's beautiful. She got long legs. Junior! Well, she has, I said, on her back one day. <laughs> she won the Kentucky Derby one year. What on earth are you talking about? Mabel, the policeman's horse. A horse? Then why don't you say what you mean? You yelled at me! Oh, I'm sorry, dear. No, you're not. Yes, I'm no, sorry. You're not. I, I was just in a jealous rage. In a jealous rage. Bless his little heart. Yeah, bless his little heart. <laughs> It won't happen again. Yeah, well, it better not, or you'll be hearing from me on Mr. Anthony's program. <laughs> and I will mention names, well, too. Tell me some more about your grandfather. Well, no, no, kiddo. Yes. You fly into one of them jealous rages again, and you'd better be careful accusing Grandpa. A man don't like to be accused of things that he hasn't done and wish he had. <laughs> Besides, we informers ain't in this squealing business for our health, you know. Well, I'll kiddo. give you a penny. Well, thanks, sporty. <laughs> Not enough. Two pennies? No, if we're going up that slow, we're going to be here all day, you know. Look, hmm? tell me all you know, yeah? and I'll buy you that toy police car in the five and ten. Kind of the policeman use that? With a horn that goes beep, beep. Yes. Machine gun goes ah. That too. And the siren goes woo. Mm, it certainly will. Well... Why do I want we sing like that? I can make all them noise in me, too. <laughs> just like your grandfather. Yeah. I mean, you're spoiled like him. Well, I don't see how he could be spoiled. The cops keep him in the can most of the time. <laughs> Does I get the nickel or don't I? I don't have any change. Well, I have change. <laughs> <laughs> me piggy banks turned out to be a hog. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll give you a nickel. Okay, warden, I'll turn, I'll turn state evidence now. Now, think <laughs> hard, Junior. Yes? Who is this Anna your grandfather got the watch for? He did somebody oh, coming. Oh, here he comes. Here he comes. Come. Give me your hand. Give me your hand. Uh, give me your hand. What are you going to do? Throw me at him? No. <laughs> I just want him to remember us as we stand here betrayed. And when he walks into this house, we are going to walk out forever. You better lay off them double features, kiddo. <laughs> give me a dear. Hmm? I want your grandfather to see how much he's hurt us both. Oh? Now try to look as sad as you can. Okay, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> no, don't look like that. We don't want to scare him to death. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you would like for me to give you a couple facial auditions or something. <laughs> Goodness. Hey, where are we going? How are we going to live if we leave here? I don't know what I'll do, but maybe I could get my old job back. I'm afraid there ain't much demand for the floor door girls this year, kiddo. Well, to make a living for us, I'll probably have to work as a scrub woman. Oh, that would be fun. I could be you mop. Yeah. You could take Hello, your portrait on too late. Hello, Myrna, dear. Hmm? Hey, there's a riot squad here. You better stand by for action. <laughs> where have you been, Pat? <laughs> At the office. Mm -hmm. Take a tip from me, Grandpa. Keep moving him around. Move around. What's wrong with you? There's Standing nothing wrong with me. I'm the same loyal wife I've been for 30 years. Yeah? <laughs> What's she crying about, Junior? That's a pretty sad speech she just made, I thought. <laughs> yes, my dear, that's right. You're the same girl I married 30 years ago today. Don't try to soft talk Don't me. Don't soft talk her. You. 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 Today. Today? <laughs> yes. Today's our 30th wedding anniversary. That's who the watch was for. Anniversary. Oh. Anniversary. <laughs> Please forgive me, dear. Oh, dear. I was all ready to accuse you of something you didn't do. Yeah. And I was all set to go out into the world of my own. Yeah. A helpless old lady. The poor old woman. Never to see you again. Never to see you again. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. no. What are you crying about? She scared herself. <laughs> Remember, we'll all be back in the next Tuesday at the same time. Until next Tuesday, then, this is Red Skelton saying goodbye now. Thanks for listening. And tune in early next week for the Look Award on Bob Hope Show. Sir Walter Raleigh, the pipe tobacco that rates superior on all counts. <laughs>
check them. A rich, ripe, full-bodied, burly blend. Sir Walter Raleigh pipe tobacco. Mellowed with rum for extra smoothness. Deep down, satisfying goodness. That's Sir Walter Raleigh pipe tobacco. Clean smoking all the way down. No soggy heel. Leaves only a clean, dry ash. And that's Sir Walter Raleigh pipe tobacco. Crimp cut for slow, even, cool burning. Yes, Sir Walter Raleigh pipe tobacco. Smoke Sir Walter Raleigh. The quality pipe tobacco of America. Good night, folks, you all. Red Scout is brought to you by the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. That's the Red Skelton Show, broadcast from January 28th of 1947. This is Chuck Shaden here on WNIB Chicago FM 97. Uh, Raleigh cigarette commercials in that show were left in for historical reference. Do those commercials bother you, the cigarette commercials? If they do, I'd like to know that because we keep them in for uh, uh, historical reference and we let you compare uh, those commercials on uh, in the good old days with those of today. But if, um, if they bother you, we'd like to know about that and see what, what comes of that. Anyway, we have a lot more coming up this afternoon. We have a uh, Fat Man program, uh, The Murder Plays Hide and Seek, starring J. Scott Smart as Brad Runyon. We have The Aldridge Family. We have Diary of Fate. We have Burns and Allen on Maxwell House Coffee Time with Rudy Valley. And The Shadow, Orson Welles as Lamont Cranston and Agnes Moorhead as the lovely Margot Lane. The Bride of Death is the story on the shadow. Next Saturday afternoon, we have uh, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, Inner Sanctum, story called Homicidal Maniac. We have Raymond Scott and the orchestra broadcasting in 1940 from the Black Hawk Restaurant with announcer Jack Brickhouse on WGN in those days. Our guest next uh, on the 26th, uh, rather the 28th next Saturday, will be Jack Brickhouse. We'll have Jack Webb starring in Pat Novak for Hire. We'll have Duffy's Tavern and a Boston Blackie program for you. Then a uh, brand new uh, Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide just got back from the printer yesterday. It'll be going out next week. If you look through it, you'll find in the um, month of February we have going to have a mystery day, all Saturday of mystery programs, Mysterious Traveler, Lights Out, Crime Club, Suspense, True Detective Mysteries, and Inner Sanctum. Then on the 11th of um, February, just before Jack Benny's uh, usual celebration of his 39th birthday on Valentine's Day, we're going to have uh, uh, the genius of Jack Benny. Six related Jack Benny broadcasts from 1943. On the 18th of February, Fibber McGee and Molly, Dangerous Assignment, Songs by Sinatra, Screen Guild Players, and Ellery Queen. And then uh, as we go along, Lux Radio Theater, First Nighter Program, Armstrong Circle Theater, Screen Directors Playhouse. A load of good listening coming up ahead of us in the weeks ahead on our Those Were the Days program. Our brand new Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide, as I said, has come back from the printers. On the cover, we have uh, Henry Aldridge and Homer Brown, Ezra Stone and Jackie Kelk. And uh, inside uh, articles, reprint articles about Fibber McGee and Molly, the cast of Radio's Gunsmoke, and Vic and Sade. Uh, we have original articles about Jack Teagarden, science fiction movies, and the roots of Chicago radio broadcasting. I would like to invite you to subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. A one-year subscription is only $7. That's 10 issues for $7. You can subscribe right now when you call us at 545-2260. That's 545-2260. Our newsletter gives you the complete lineup of the good old shows we broadcast every Saturday afternoon, including original broadcast dates and the length of each segment we program, plus the list of memory movies you see every Saturday night at Northwest Federal beginning tonight. 545-2260. Give us a call now. Sometime this afternoon, we'll get your subscription rolling right away. If you like, you can send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But why not give us a call this afternoon at 545-2260. 545-2260. And when we send the uh, general February mailing out to all of our regular subscribers by the middle of next week, your name will be included and we'll include a, uh, an invoice 
along with your um, uh, first issue. 545-2260. time comes to buy or build a dream home, my friends, be sure to think of Northwest Federal Savings for your home loan. Yowza, yowza. A Northwest Federal home loan, my friends, will let you sleep with pleasant dreams, cause you'll have a loan just made for you, and you, and you. Yowza, yowza. One of the laddies from Northwest Fed will check over the plans and take a peek peek at that home you dreamed about. And in no time at all, my friends, you'll see how much help Northwest Federal can be. Just make a requester and we'll show try our bester. With a home loan from the leader and all the lads. Northwest Federal Savings, yowza yowza. Au revoir. A fond cheerio, a bit of a tweet tweet, bless you, and pleasant dreams. Northwest Federal Savings, serving you 63 hours a week in Chicago on Irving Park Road, downtown on Randolph near Michigan, in Edison Park, Des Plaines, Norridge, and Arlington Heights. Chuck Shaden here with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago, FM 97. Now we're going back to 1947 for a uh, program on the American Broadcasting Company Network originally. This is the Fat Man. Uh, Brad Runyon was the Fat Man, portrayed by J. Scott Smart. The 270-pound detective created by Dashiell Hammett was the Fat Man. This is a program uh, sponsored originally by Pepto-Bismol. Murder plays hide-and-seek on the Fat Man. When your stomach's upset... Don't add to the upset. Take soothing Pepto-Bismol and feel good again. There he goes into that drugstore. He's stepping on the scale. Weight, 237 pounds. Fortune, danger. <laughs> The Fat Man. The Norwich Pharmacal Company, makers of Pepto-Bismol, Unguentine, and other fine drug products, brings you the adventures of Dashiell Hammett's fascinating and exciting character, The Fat Man, a fast-moving criminologist who tips the scales at 237 pounds. Tonight's adventure, starring J. Scott Smart in Murder Plays Hide and Seek. And now, from New York, Pepto-Bismol brings you The Fat Man. The housing shortage may be bad, but there's one place I know of that always has room for another tenant. It's a big gray structure near the river, and the windows are crossed with iron bars, and the landlord never asks you for a penny in rent. If you're an extra special customer, they even give you a private suite in a secluded part of the building that leads directly to a room with a heavy chair. That room is reserved for the guys who find out that they can't get away with murder. The fat man learned his business the hard way. But there's an easy way to care for an upset stomach. Just don't overdose with antacids or physics. Instead, take Pepto-Bismol, the gentle way to help settle and sweeten the stomach quickly. Pepto-Bismol calms and quiets the disturbance by spreading a soothing protective coating on irritated stomach and intestinal walls. You begin to lose that queasy, uneasy feeling right away. The next time careless eating or overindulgence gives you acid stomach, nervous indigestion, or heartburn, you'll get quick relief if you remember this. When your stomach's upset, don't add to the upset. 
Take soothing Pepto-Bismol and feel good again. Now, the fat man in Murder Plays Hide and Seek. Inasmuch as eating is one habit I find very hard to break, I usually prefer my clients to have enough cash to pay for my work. In Andy Maroney's case, however, I made an exception to the rule. I've known Andy for quite a while, and I can guess what he earns driving that hack of his around from dusk to dawn. With a wife and three kids, you can't afford any fancy fees for a private detective. It was almost three in the morning when Andy knocked on my apartment door. <clears throat> All right. All right. Keep your shirt on. I'm coming. <sighs> Who is it? It's Andy Maroney, Mr. Runyon. The hacky. Well, what's on your mind, Andy? I, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't do it. You've got to help me, see? Now, take it easy, Andy. I, I thought he was drunk when she asked me to take him home. I had nothing to do with it, Mr. Reddy, to help me. Now, will you calm down long enough to make some sense? Huh? I'm talking about the stiff. The guy who was croaked. What guy? Where is he? Downstairs, in the back of my cab. For the love of Mike, will you hurry? Well, do you mind if I put some clothes on? I'll lose my license. I'll lose my job, and they'll put me in the cooler for 160 years. Here, hand me those shoes. You're a right guy, Mr. Runyon. Every hacky knows you're okay. You help me out of this, and I'll pay you back if it takes the rest of my life. Well, it's too long to wait. Put this one on the house. There we are. Now I'll get my coat and we'll be off. Okay, come on. I got the hack parked in the front of the door. As soon as I saw the guy was dead, I made a beeline for your flat. I figured I could explain it better to you than I could to the cop. You ever seen him before? No. He was sitting in the back of my cab when I came out of the beanery. I, I only left the car parked for about 20 minutes while I got some sinkers and some java. A blonde dame standing by the cab handed me five bucks to take him home, so I figured he was drunk. Here, out this way. There's the hack. He's flopped over in the rear seat. What is this, Andy? A corny gag? Holy smoke. The stiff is gone. You must have been dreaming. Uh, he was there, I tell you, on the level. He was sitting there in the back five minutes ago. How do you know he was dead? Because I shook him. I felt his pulse. There was blood coming out of his mouth. Now, wait a minute. What's this on the floor? It's his hat. That's the hat the guy was wearing. Yeah, his initials are on the sweatband. C.H. Where were you taking him, Andy? Did this blonde give you his address? Yeah, but it turned out to be a phony. That's when I found out he was dead. I thought he'd passed out, and I, I tried to shake him into giving me his right house number. Would you recognize the woman if you saw her again? In a minute. She was a tall job, easy on the eyes. She was standing on the sidewalk next to my hack, uh, wearing an evening gown. You mean without a coat in this weather? Well, come to think of it, she didn't have a coat. Go on. Get into this jalopy, and let's get started. Where are we going? Back to the corner where you met your customer. <laughs> This is it, Mr. Runyon. Yeah. What's that joint over there? A nightclub? Yeah, the Venetian blind. It's a fancy dump that gets the ermine crowd. Well, if that blonde wasn't wearing a coat, she must have come out of there. Well, it's almost four o'clock. This joint must be closed. Well, we'll try it anyway. Yeah. Closed up like I said. See anything through the glass in the door? There's a light on in the hall. Wait a minute. A dame's coming out. Uh, no, it ain't the same one. Oh, good evening. I'm sorry. The club is closed for the night. You work in here, miss? Yes, I do. This isn't a pickup. I'm just looking for information. Did you happen to see a good-looking, tall, blonde woman? She was wearing a silver evening dress an hour ago? That sounds like Mrs. Rogers, the owner. Is she inside? Yes, I think so. What are you, a policeman? What gives you that impression? You act like one. My name is Runyon. I'm a private detective. I've got a little business with your boss. He's in her office, I imagine. 
Come inside and I'll show you where it is. Thanks. Is everybody else going home for the night? I guess so. I'm Peggy Dale. I sing with the orchestra. Hey, Peggy! Oh, I thought you'd gone, Frank. I was waiting for you, baby. I hope maybe I could take you home. Uh, who's this? He's a private detective. His name is Runyon. What's the matter? Something wrong? That all depends. Who are you? Frank Cooley. I handle the drums in the band. What's up? We're looking for a stolen corpse. You what? Do you, you two happen to know anyone with the initials C.H.? Uh, not me. I know a woman named Hunt. Clarissa Hunt. This particular C.H. is a man. There she is, Mr. Runyon. It's Mrs. Rogers. What's going on here? Are you sure she's the woman who handed you the fiver, Randy? Positive, Mr. Runyon. You remember me, lady? No. I'm uh, sure you remember. You asked me to take that trunk home, and you gave me a fine spot to do it. I never saw you before in my life. It's a frame. She's lying, I tell you. Relax, Sandy. Mrs. Rogers, you wouldn't be holding out on us by any chance, huh? I don't know what you're talking about. That drunk that Andy chauffeured for was dead. You wouldn't like to be mixed up in a murder rap, would you? No. Then how about a few details? I don't know anything about a drunk or a dead man. I never saw this moron before. Listen, you double-crossing hen. I ain't taking it in the neck for nobody. Pipe down, Andy. Mr. Runyon. What's the matter? Look, under that drape, near the window. There's a guy's feet sticking out. Stay where you are now, all three of you. What? It, it's Charlie Haney. And he's dead. Well, it looks like we found our body, Andy. Uh, well, wait a minute, Mr. Runyon. That ain't the same guy who was in my cab. Two hours later, I was in Lieutenant McKenzie's office at headquarters. The dawn was just about breaking, and I listened to Mac's autopsy report as I sipped a welcome container of steaming coffee. Charlie Haney was poisoned, Brad. Stuff was slipped into a drink. What about the blood on his mouth? Poison they used was dynamite. Brought on a hemorrhage. The guy in Andy's cab got his walking papers in the exact same way. I don't know. I'm inclined to think that Charlie Haney and the guy in Maroney's hack were one and the same. Why? Because the initials in the hat? That's one reason. And Maroney admitted the back of his cab was dark when he looked at his passenger. He's scared, Mac. He'll admit almost anything if he thought he'd save you a little trouble. Now, personally, I think we're dealing with two different killings. And both the victims have the same initials. Then what happened to corpse number one? Well, it's a cinch he didn't walk to a funeral partner to, to get himself registered. Well, I question the girl, the musician, and Mrs. Rogers. You any dope? Uh, not much. Charlie Haney was the jack of all trades around the Venetian blind. Did odd jobs for Mrs. Rogers. Sometimes he'd throw out on a strepless customer. A bouncer, huh? He was big enough. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Well, in any case, I had nothing on him, so I let him loose. I might have held Mrs. Rogers on suspicion, but her battery of lawyers would have sprung her anyway. What about Andy Maroney? Well, he's in the clear so far. I'm letting him go back to his cab, but I'm padlocking the Venetian blind while the investigation goes on. If you don't mind my saying so, Mac, that isn't a very smart move. No. Why? I think you'd be better off to keep the club open and give the killer a chance to show up again. Uh, look, Brad, I'm going to ask you for a favor. Okay, shoot. Lay off this case. Why? Well, first of all, your client's in the clear, so that's taken care of. And secondly? I won't buy your theory about two victims. And it's the kind of a thing that might confuse the investigation. Sensitive, Mac? Now, you know better than that. <laughs> I'm just saying that your guesswork is cockeyed. And I'm going to have enough trouble solving the murder of one victim without searching for an imaginary corpse. Hello? Yes, Mackenzie speaking. What? Oh. Yeah, I'll be right over. Here, Brad. Have a cigar. You look as if you're giving away a prize. I am. One of the motorcycle squad just picked up a dead man under the Queensboro Bridge. The initials on his wallet were C.H. <laughs> Murder plays hide and seek on the Fat Man, a broadcast from Jan uh, from 1947. I don't have a specific uh, 
uh, date at all on uh, this uh, particular show. But it's a good one, a rather rare one, too, because most of the Fat Man shows that we have in our collection are from a, a Canadian broadcasting company uh, version of the show, which were not, which were different shows than the um, the actual stateside uh, program. So this is kind of an interesting uh, one to have uh, in light of the fact that we don't have too many of them. We'll get back to the Fat Man in just a moment. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. You buy with confidence when you get the townhouse guarantee from townhouse TV and appliances. Give them a try. They won't be undersold, and you won't be underserviced. Shop around, get the best deal possible, and then visit townhouse. Townhouse guarantees that you'll get the best price on the hundreds of Frigidaire refrigerators, washers, dryers, and ranges in stock. And there's more. Townhouse guarantees to make delivery on the day promised, guarantees normal installation on all products delivered, guarantees to move your old appliance to the basement or the garage, or to remove it from the premises if you wish. Check with Townhouse and take advantage of the big Townhouse guarantee from Townhouse TV and Appliances, 7243 Tui Avenue, just west of Harlem. Open Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Womack. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where convenience is important, and so are you. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Quality plus value, seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmette. Now let's get back to 1947 and the Fat Man. I rode over to the Queensboro Bridge with Mackenzie and saw the body. It was identified by Andy as the guy he'd had in his cab. And a card in his wallet gave his name as Casper Hall. They took him back to the morgue for an autopsy, but I was pretty sure of what they'd find. So I drove back to my apartment to catch up with a few hours of sleep. It must have been 11 or 11.30 in the morning when I found myself with another guest. And this one was just as unexpected as the last. Yeah, just a second. Hmm. One of these days, I'm liable to get myself some sleep. Good morning, Mr. Runyon. Well, good morning. Come in. Thanks. I'm uh, sorry the room's in such a mess. I wasn't expecting company. That's all right. You're the guy I saw last night, the guy that sings the Venetian blind. That's right, Peggy Dale. Uh, cigarette, Peggy? No, thank you. Where are you going? I want to look out the window. I had a feeling I was being followed. Anybody there? Street's empty. What's on your mind, sweetheart? Before I tell you anything, I want to be sure you won't tell anybody I told you. Oh, is it that hot? It might be. Okay, I'll play ball. Let's have it. They're holding Mrs. Rogers at headquarters now. Are they? Again? When they found the man named Casper Hall, they took that taxi driver's word against hers about putting him into the cab. Oh, yeah? I was there when they questioned Mrs. Rogers. They questioned me as well. She finally admitted putting Hall into the cab. And her excuse was that she thought he was a drunk and she wanted to get rid of him so he wouldn't raise a fuss. Well, that sounds logical to me. But one thing she didn't tell them. What's that? That she'd seen and talked to Casper Hall before. You knew that? He's been in the Venetian blind a dozen times. And I've seen him at the same table with Mrs. Rogers. Did you tell that to the lieutenant? No. Why not? Because Mrs. Rogers would have heard me. I'm scared of her, Mr. Runyon. She's hard and she's mean. It's not only my job. I didn't want to end up the way poor Charlie did. Well, I can't blame you for that. She's been mixed up with gangsters and racketeers ever since she went into the nightclub business. I've seen some of them at the blind. So you decided to spill the beans to me, hmm? You can tell the lieutenant, but I don't want any part of it. Okay, Peggy. Thanks for calling. Oh, by the way, uh, is Mackenzie padlocking the club? No. He was going to, but he changed his mind. Will you be there tonight? I guess so. Why? I just wanted to ask you to save me a ringside table. The Venetian blind seems to have the most interesting floor show in town. <laughs> I checked with Mackenzie and gave him the dope, but he couldn't hang on to Mrs. Rogers. 
He didn't have enough evidence to get an indictment yet. That meant Mrs. Rogers would be back in her club that night. And so would I. I got in touch with Andy Maroney, who showed up at my flat about 10, just as I was putting the finishing touches to the soup and fish. Sit down, Andy. Be with you in a minute. Hey, you look pretty slick in that outfit, Mr. Runyon. Well, you said the Venetian blind catered to the Ehrman crowd, so I decided to get the dinner jacket out of mothballs. You know, I was just thinking. Yeah, what? My uncle. Yeah? What about your uncle? He was buried in an outfit like that. Stop being so cheerful. I intend to wear it vertically. Uh, you want me to drive you over? Yeah, that's why I called. There's something else I want you to do. Anything you say. When I go into that club, I want you to park outside and keep your eyes open. If I'm not out of there within two hours, get a hold of the police. Oh, expecting trouble? I'm not expecting it, Andy. I'm looking forward to it. It had started to snow when we got down to the street. The night was crisp and cold. If I hadn't been so busy admiring the weather, I might have noticed that Andy's hack, which was standing in front of the door, was occupied once again. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Runyon. Oh, what are you doing here, Cooley? I want to talk to you. Okay, move over. Drive straight to the Venetian blind, Andy. Right. Don't drive to the blind. Let's go in the other direction. Say, hey, who's giving the orders around here? I am. Hey, he's got a gun. Drive in the other direction, Andy, as the gentleman requests. I'd put that gun away, Frankie. Drums are safer to fool with. I'll put it away when I'm good and ready. Suit yourself. And I'll be ready when I put a slug in you. Been drinking? That's none of your business. Funny how a pint of booze makes a lion out of, of a mouse. I'll show you who's a mouse when we get out of town, fat man. Mr. Runyon. Keep driving, Andy. Yeah, yeah, keep on driving. Unless you want the top of your head opened up for ventilation. Before you start popping that cannon, I hope you'll explain why you picked me for a target... You know why. Oh, do I? You should have had sense enough to keep out of this. You wise and hymed yourself right onto a slab. Who are you covering for, Frankie? Yourself? Never mind the questions. Because up to now, it was Mrs. Rogers who held my interest. S Mrs. Rogers? Yeah. If you're covering for her, you're just wasting your time. By tomorrow morning, we'll have enough on your boss to get an indictment. You're a... Uh, you're uh... Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Well, I was, until you shoved that rod in my rib. Now I'm beginning to change my mind. Yeah, so am I. Really? Stop this cab, mister. There are lots of people in this section, Cooley. You're not going to risk any fireworks in a spot like this, are you? Keep driving and don't look back. Go on and beat it. Keeper. For a minute, I thought he was going to knock the two of us off. And so did I. But instead, he gave me a brand new angle. There's a cop on the corner. Do you want to make a report? Now, forget it. I may have a much more interesting report to make to the cops later on. It was almost 11 when we got to the Venetian blind. The place was pretty well crowded. The customers were dressed to kill, and most of the gals were flashing diamonds. Marsha Rogers' sucker list would have matched the social register. Instead of taking a table, I sat at the bar where the view was better. The floor show wasn't the only thing I wanted to see. Give me a rum and Coca-Cola. You can put it on the house, Pete. Thanks, but I like to buy my own. I had a feeling you'd be back here tonight, fat man. I would have been disappointed if you didn't show. You do a good business, don't you, Mrs. Rogers? Not bad. Found any corpses tonight? Now, don't start trying to be funny. You're liable to find you've outstayed your welcome. Still in your silver gown, huh? I thought you'd be wearing black. For whom? Casper Hall. Casper didn't mean anything to me. That's something you might have to prove. I was informed he spent a lot of time here. So do my other customers. Yeah, but they don't usually get picked up cold under the Queensborough Bridge. The cops haven't got anything on me. They don't even have enough to close up my club. That's where you're mistaken, Marcia. Then why didn't they shut me up? Because I asked them not to. You? Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm not getting philanthropic. Then what's the big idea? Well, maybe I like your entertainment. 
Oh, by the way, where's your regular drummer? Cooley? Yeah. He quit. Why? Don't ask me. When a musician wants to leave, I don't call the FBI and check up on him. I have a little surprise for you, sweetheart. Have you? I think I got this double murder partially solved. You're a very smart boy. When Casper Hall was poisoned, the killer didn't expect him to leave the club so soon. After he was helped out, Charlie Haney, a bouncer, was sent after his body. What did he want the body for, a souvenir? There must have been something Hall was carrying that the killer wanted. Charlie couldn't frisk him fast enough while he lay in the cab. So he snatched the body and ditched it under the bridge. Then who killed Charlie Haney? The one who killed Casper Hall. Charlie knew too much. He was just dumb enough to stick his neck out. Then why don't you make an arrest? Well, because I haven't put my hand on the murderer yet. How would you like to set yourself up for the candidate? You're crazy. You knew he was dying when you helped him into that cab. And don't hand me that drunk story. It doesn't gel. I thought you said Casper got out of here too fast. Would I have pushed him into a cab and then sent Charlie after him? No. That's why I'm crossing you off my list. But I still think you're holding out. And in case you don't know it, baby, an accomplice sits right on top of the killer's lap when they give him the chair. Why should I hold out? That's not the $64 question, sweetheart. The point is, why didn't you yell for the cops in the first place when you found Casper Hall five minutes from the grave? You want me to tell you why? Yes. Casper must have given you something when you put him in that cab. He gave you what the killer wanted and what Charlie Haney was sent out to get. Well, baby, how am I doing? You're doing fine. Come with me. She took me to her office without another word. And I had the feeling my bluff was paying off in spades. The theory was a good one, and it accounted for everything that happened. But I couldn't prove it in a hundred years if she'd wanted to call me on it. The office was dark when I opened the door, but I caught the sound of someone bumping into a chair as I stepped inside. Stand still, Mrs. Rogers. There's someone in this room, and I'm telling that someone now that I'll shoot to kill if I see anything move when the lights go on. Snap the switch, Mrs. Rogers. Peggy! I was just... She's trying to get at my safe. That's not true. What do you got in your safe that's so important, Mrs. Rogers? I'll show you in just a minute. <laughs> now stand... Stand right there, Peggy, like a nice little girl. Here. Here, this, this is what Casper Hall gave me the night he died. There are slips of paper in this envelope, written in longhand. In the last few months, six of my customers were robbed after they left my place. Their names are on those slips. They were all held up after on their way home, and the police never found the gunman. There's more than just a name on each piece of paper. There's a description of a car, the license number, an address, and the list of jewelry. Casper Hall was tipped off whenever an important customer made a reservation. Those women used to come here loaded with jewelry. Someone must have gotten the information beforehand and then handed it to Casper outside on those strips of paper. Then all he had to do was follow the right car. Would you know who that someone is, Peggy? No. Oh, now, don't be coy, sweetheart. I had you tagged when your drummer boy, Frankie Cooley, wanted to take me for a ride. He was crazy enough about you to commit murder and keep you in the clear, Peggy. But he changed his mind when I told him I was after Mrs. Rogers. Give me that envelope. Oh, no, not so fast, baby. I need this myself for a while. We're going to do a little handwriting analysis. He crossed me. The rat held out. And he used those slips like a club over my head. That kind of an argument ought to make a big hit with a jury. Mrs. Rogers, why didn't you hand those slips over to the police? I only held those slips for one reason. If the thing leaked out before you grabbed the killer, I'd have been ruined. No one would have come here anymore. They'd all been scared to death. Didn't Casper tell you who gave him the slips? Casper couldn't talk when I helped him out and put him in that cab. All he could do was push that envelope in my hand. I was frightened, and, and I only wanted to get rid of them in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Well, i got to hand it to you, Peggy. You certainly must have what it takes. Drop dead, fat man. <laughs> Knowing you were going to kill Charlie Haney because he knew too much... You charmed him into frisking a corpse. Then you sick Frank Cooley on me with a rod in his hand. But you're going to run into one guy who won't fall for the pretty dimple, sweetheart. The public executioner at Sing Sing. The 
Fat Man returns in a moment. It's a shame to let an upset stomach interfere with your work or your fun. And it needn't if you keep a bottle of Pepto-Bismol in your medicine chest. Pepto-Bismol helps you and your children to quick relief from sour stomach, acid indigestion, heartburn, and other common digestive upsets. This famous pink liquid helps settle and sweeten the stomach, calms and quiets that queasy, uneasy, sickish feeling. Get a bottle of Pepto-Bismol from your druggist tonight. Pepto-Bismol is a dependable product of the Norwich Pharmacal Company, also makers of Unguentine, the first thought in Burns. Next week, Pepto-Bismol presents Dashiell Hammett's exciting character, the fat man, in the adventure called Murder Finds a Decoy. And now, a word from the fat man. Ever since the beginning of time, the female of the species has been beguiling the male with her charms. And the male, since the beginning of time, has been falling into the trap quite willingly. But both male and female are most unwilling victims when murder finds the decoy... Tonight's Adventure of the Fat Man, starring J. Scott Smart, was written by Lawrence Clee and directed by Clark Andrews. Music is under the direction of Bernard Green. Heard tonight were Helen Flint as Marcia and Joe Harding as Andy. Remember, when your stomach's upset, don't add to the upset. Take soothing Pepto-Bismol and feel good again. Charles Irving speaking. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. That's the Fat Man, a 1947 broadcast sponsored by Pepto-Bismol. I wonder if there would be any significance to the fact that uh, Pepto-Bismol was sponsoring uh, a program called the Fat Man. I think <laughs> on the theory that <laughs> a fat man would have more use for Pepto-Bismol than someone else. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? This is Chuck Shaden here on our Those Were the Days program, WNIB Chicago, FM 97 every Saturday. We're with you with lots of sounds from the past, some memories, uh, some recollections, and, well, just an afternoon of good entertainment. The fine family of Paterno offers you a selection of fine wines from the vineyards of the world, from California to France, from Italy to Portugal. You'll find the Paterno wine cellar stocked with the widest selection of wines from all the best places. Paterno Foremost Liquors at 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. It's the largest beverage store of its kind in all Chicagoland. A visit to the Paterno Wine Cellar is an experience you won't forget. You'll return often to keep your own wine cellar stocked. Whether it's an intimate candlelit dinner for two or an important dinner party for quite a few, you'll find everything you need to add the word special to your next occasion. Visit the wine cellar at Paterno Foremost Liquors, open Monday through Saturday from 9 in the morning till 10 at night, Sunday from noon to 6. Paterno Foremost Liquors, 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. We'll be tuning in to uh, the Aldridge family, Diary of Fate, Maxwell House Coffee Time with Burns and Allen, and The Shadow before the old clock on the wall says uh, we have to go at 5 o'clock. But right now, we want to share with you a sound from one of our two Lights Out broadcasts on our cassette tape of the month for January. Ironized Yeast presents Lights Out, everybody. It is later than... brings you stories of the supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the terrors of the unknown. We tell you this frankly, so if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. This is Arch Oboe. 
He walks the earth, the little man. You look at him and say, what can he do? But then comes war and barbarism threatens his own home, and suddenly the little man towers over the earth, a figure of vengeance. This, too, tonight is a story of vengeance. He's quite a uh, scene setter there, that Arch Obler, and uh, he's setting the scene on one of uh, two great Lights Out programs from the 1940s that are available as our cassette tape of the month for January. A mystery double header, two Lights Out programs, The Meteor Man and Until Dead. They're back to back on an hour long cassette tape for January, only $5 from the hall closet. Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Until Dead is a drama of a man found guilty of murdering his wife and how he seeks revenge on the man he believes to be really guilty. Broadcast from February 2nd of 1943. The Meteor Man is a Lights Out program from December 22nd of 1942. A fascinating story about a multitude of shooting stars that reach the planet Earth, and then one of those shooting stars is found to contain a growing flesh. Boy, two goodies uh, from the imaginative mind of Arch Obler. A pair of new Lights Out shows for your good old collection. It's our cassette tape of the month for January. Only $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Or you can get your tape at any of the six offices of Northwest Federal Savings, including the new downtown office on Randolph near Michigan, or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. Two lights out broadcast, Until Dead and The Meteor Man. Five dollars from the hall closet, box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Well, I want to remind you once again that our Memory Club re resumes tonight in the, uh, in the new auditorium at the Northwest Community Center, the addition to Northwest Federal Savings at 4901 Irving Park Road in Chicago. Now, we have tonight as our premier film for 1978 a 1930 uh, goodie with uh, the Marx Brothers. It's called Animal Crackers with Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo. And to uh, get you in the mood for the good movie tonight, we have this little snippet from the past with the Marx Brothers. Professor Quincy Adams Wagstaff. Members of the faculty, faculty members, students of Huxley and Huxley students. I guess that covers everything. Well, I thought my razor was dull until I heard his speech. And that reminds me of a story that's so dirty I'm ashamed to think of it myself. Professor Wagstaff, of course is the inimitable Groucho Marx. Signor Emmanuel Ravelli. How do you do? Say, I used to know a fellow looked exactly like you by the name of uh, Emmanuel Ravelli. Are you his brother? I am Emmanuel Ravelli. You're Emmanuel Ravelli? I am Emmanuel Ravelli. Well, no wonder you look like him. But I still insist there is a resemblance. <laughs> Hey, he thinks I look alike. Senor Ravelli, of course, is the inimitable Chico Marx. And last but not least, for the first time on any record, the one and only Harpo Marx. The gate swung open and a fig Newton entered. How do you do? Who is he? That's my partner, Patino Speak. Oh, that's your silent partner. Yes, these are the fabulous Marx Brothers, who created a style of comedy that has never been matched. Their target was the establishment, and they specialized in throwing low blows at people in high places, like educators. And I say to you, gentlemen, that this college is a failure. The trouble is we're neglecting football for education. Exactly. exactly. The, the professor, professor is right. right. Oh, I'm right, am I? Well, I'm not right, I'm wrong. I just said that to test you. Now I know where I'm at. I'm dealing with a couple of snakes. What I meant to say was that there's too much football and not enough education. That's, That's what, what I think. think. Oh, you do, do you? Well, you're wrong again. If there was a snake here, I'd apologize. Where would this college be without football? Have we got a stadium? Yes. Have we got a college? Yes. Well, we can't support both. Tomorrow we start tearing down the college. But, but professor, professor, where, where will, will the, the students, students sleep? sleep? Well, they always sleep in the classroom. They satirized protocol between diplomats. 
Now, how about lending this country $20 million, you old skin flint? $20 million is a lot of money. I'd like to take that up with my Minister of Finance. Well, in the meantime, could you let me have $12 until payday? They lampoon business executives. Uh, take a letter. Who to? To my dentist. Uh, dear dentist, enclose fine check for $500. Yours very truly. Send that off immediately. I'll, uh, I'll have to enclose the check first. You do, and I'll fire you. They ridicule the law. I didn't know you were a lawyer. You're awfully shy for a lawyer. You bet I'm shy. I'm a shy for a lawyer. They mocked respect for womanhood. As chairwoman of the reception committee, I welcome you with open arms. Is that so? How late do you stay open? I've sponsored your appointment because I feel you are the most able statesman in all Fredonia. Well, that covers a lot of ground. Say, you cover a lot of ground yourself. Oh, your excellency. You're not so bad yourself. You better beat it. I hear they're going to tear you down and put up an office building where you're standing. You can leave in a taxi. If you can't get a taxi, you can leave in a huff. If that's too soon, you can leave in a minute and a huff. You know you haven't stopped talking since I came here? You must have been vaccinated with a phonograph needle. Those crazy Marx brothers, they'll be on the screen in their 1930 uh, comedy hit, Animal Crackers. Uh, Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo. Margaret Dumont is in this, and this is the one where uh, Groucho struts his way through uh, his all-time great hooray for Captain Spaulding. You'll have to see it. It's on the screen tonight in the Memory Club over in the Community uh, Center Auditorium, the new auditorium at Northwest Federal now. 4901 West Irving Park Road, 300-seat uh, theater, comfortable seating, sloped floor, large screen on the stage, refreshment counter, you'll have to see it. Dues, uh, the Memory Club, $1.25. All seats are a dollar and a quarter. Come on over and have a good time. Payable at the door. You're a member of our group because you're a member of our listening audience, so don't hesitate to join us tonight. If you come... Coming for the first time, you uh, enter uh, through the parking lot at the rear of the office now, with the, at the entrance to the new Clyde B. Reed Auditorium, named after the founder of Northwest Federal Savings. If you come by bus, you want to walk um, uh, south along the side of the building and then west a little bit till you get to the entrance of the auditorium. And we'll see you there tonight. We will be there to uh, see this premiere film, Animal Crackers, from 1930. If you're coming to the memory movie tonight, you may want to stop ahead of time at uh, our Metro Golden Memory Shop, which is not too far from Northwest Federal. We're at 5941 West Irving Park Road. That's just east of Austin, and Northwest Federal is just west of Cicero. So it's not too far in there. And don't forget now you can save 10% or more on anything in the store. It's our special discount sale, and uh, you come in anytime between now and the 31st of January you'll get some special savings because every single item in the store, even the married items, you're going to be uh, finding that they'll reduce by 10%. 10% everything in the store except our current cassette of the month. Otherwise, 10% off anything. Books, records, tapes, magazines, cards, gifts, and novelties. All the old-time radio tapes, the old-time radio records, on cassette, whatever, at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road. And we have some other things, too. We have a special selection of old-time radio cassettes not offered as part of our regular Cassette of the Month series. Uh, we made a special purchase on this. There are 30-minute tapes, 30-minute tapes, so there's one program on each tape. Uh, we must have a, a 100 or 200 of those. We're selling them for $1 each or 6 for $5. That's a very special buy, and while the supply lasts, you can get them at the MGM shop. We also have um, uh, those jigsaw puzzles, nostalgic jigsaw puzzles, 25% discount on those. They're usually $4. You'll get them for $3, I think. Marx Brothers, uh, jigsaw puzzle, Clark Gable, Marilyn Monroe, Humphrey Bogart. You really must come in to our Metro Golden Memory Shop during our special discount sale now, today, through January 31st. And we're open every day, Monday through Friday, from 11 to 5.30, Saturday till 7.30, and Sunday afternoon tomorrow we'll be there from noon to 5. And, yes, we will be there tomorrow. Be happy to uh, have you come in and say hello. We'll be there all afternoon tomorrow. So I hope you can uh, join us uh, tonight or tomorrow. Make sure when you come in you register for our drawing. We're going to have 10 $10 MGM Shop gift certificates given away on the drawing on February 1st. You don't have to be present. Uh, we'll notify you if you're a winner, and you don't have to buy anything. 
uh, just pop in and sign your name and uh, register for the drawing. And when you do come in during this uh, special discount sale, get a copy of your free uh, Nostalgia Party Planner. It's a little booklet that we've put together uh, that helps you have a nice nostalgia party for the 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s. So there's lots of stuff going on at the MGM shop um, in the next 10 days or so. So why don't you come in? 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. And uh, I think you'll find that um, we'll treat you right, and you'll have a nice, nice visit with uh, the good old days as you snoop around. Cause everything that we have in the shop is a minimum of 10% discount. Now, that's all of our regular items, and no matter what our regular sale price might have been, you're getting a special break on it. In other words, uh, um, sometimes we have, we have lots of books about the movies, and if the regular price of a book was uh, twelve ninety five, our MGM shop price might have been um, seven ninety five or three ninety five. Sometimes we have special deals on those. If it's three ninety five as our special price, you get ten percent off of that too. So uh, you can't hardly go wrong. Uh, this is the time. We'd like to uh, introduce you to the MGM shop. If you haven't been there before, this is a good chance to come in and see us. And if you've been there before, then this is a chance for you to come in and take advantage of a, a little special deal that we have for you. So we hope tonight or tomorrow, we'll be there tomorrow or any time in the next 10 days or so, pop into the MGM shop. Now let's go back to uh, 1948 here with our Those Were the Days program. Coming your way on WNIB Chicago. December 16th of 1948. The program was sponsored by Jello on the National Broadcasting Company. We have Ezra Stone as uh, Henry Aldridge with Jackie Kelk as Homer. We have House Jameson and Catherine Roth as um, Mr. and Mrs. Aldridge in the Aldridge family. Family presents Henry Henry Aldrich. Come in, Mother. Yes, it's the Aldrich family, based on characters originated by Clifford Goldsmith, and starring Ezra Stone as Henry with Jackie Couch as Homer. And yes, it's the Jello family, with its three famous desserts: Jello in those six delicious flavors. Jell-O puddings with that old-fashioned homemade flavor and Jell-O tapioca puddings. A miracle of goodness, a marvel of speed. For desserts that are delicious, boy, believe me, you should know. They are made by famous J-E-L-L-O. And now for the Aldrich family. A typical teenage boy like Henry Aldrich is as unpredictable as the weather. And like the weather, he can change in a moment from storm to calm. And usually, a whole household changes with him. The scene opens in the Aldrich living room. It is early Saturday evening. Sam, would you like me to put another log on the fire? No, thank you, Alice. I wouldn't mind a bit, dear. I know you like to be warm when you're reading. Alice, there's only one thing I really like when I'm reading. What, dear? not to be talked to. Well, you won't have to worry about Henry bothering you tonight. He'll be out of the house the whole evening. And frankly, I don't know why one of us didn't think of it years ago. Putting him out of the house? No, dear. Arranging for the children to have a party at a different home each week. Mm. It'll be so much easier sitting in the kitchen one night every two months when we know that the rest of the time we can read in the living room in peace and quiet. We can? Of course, dear. Just as you are now. Yes. Elizabeth said she thought the idea was a stroke of genius. But I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Would you, Sam? <laughs> Alice, I think your idea is wonderful. It's brilliant. It gives me an opportunity to read this book. Now, suppose I read it. Dear, you can't read it if you keep on talking all the time. <laughs> Mother! Yes, Henry? Have you been making any rag rugs recently? Any what? Rag rugs! Rag rugs! I can't find my maroon. Socks. Henry, your socks are in your top drawer. I'm sorry, Mother, they are, and I've turned my drawers inside out. <laughs> well, that's strange because I distinctly remember putting them away. Alice, why don't you...
don't you go upstairs and help him look? Well, while I'm doing that, will you please answer the phone? Now, wait a minute. Uh, Henry's perfectly capable of finding his own socks. But, dear... You answer the phone. Mother! Alice, Henry's calling you. What is it, Henry? The phone's ringing. Yes, dear, I know. Hello? Hello, is that you, Mrs. Aldrich? Yes, how are you, Homa? Okay, I guess, except for my arms. Your arms? They're just sort of aching from carrying a couple of armchairs out to the kitchen for my parents. But don't worry, they'll be in shape by the time Agnes gets here. Your parents? No, my arms. <laughs> Could I speak to Henry, please? Dear, Henry's in his bare feet, but he'll see you at your party in a little while. In his bare feet? Father! Goodbye, Homer. I know, but... Father! Oh, Sam! Yes? Henry's calling you. Henry, your mother told you where your socks were. They found my socks, Father. I had them on. Alice, <laughs> do you think we should have his eyes examined? Dear, the only trouble with Henry is his body works faster than his mind. Father, what I can't find now is your tie clip. Now, stay here. Sam, I'll go look for it. You just go back to your book. Perhaps I should wait until Henry's mind catches up with the rest of it. Oh, my goodness. Hello? Mrs. Aldrich, we were cut off. Homer, what is it you want? I have to speak to Henry. It's very urgent. <laughs> just a minute. Henry! Yes, Mother? Homer wants you on the phone. I can't come now. I'm taking a bath. Dear, I thought you were all dressed except your feet. I was, but I just got shoe polish on me. <laughs> Hello, Homer? Is he coming, Mrs. Aldrich? No, he can't right now. Suppose you give me the message. Well, listen, Mrs. Aldrich, I've got some bad news. Our radio's just gone on the bum. Really? And we won't have anything to dance to. Homer, couldn't you play the piano? How could you dance to Home Sweet Home? <laughs> Dear, haven't you been studying for years and years? Only five, Mrs. Aldrich. And all you can play is Home Sweet Home? Sure. She was I'm no child prodigy. <laughs> oh, well, I wish I could suggest something, but... Well, as a matter of fact, how is your radio working, Mrs. Aldrich? Our radio? Oh, I'm afraid Mr. Aldrich wouldn't let that out of the house. Well, Mrs. Aldrich, did you ever hear that saying about the mountain and Mohammed? What's that? If your radio can't come to us, I'm sure the gang wouldn't mind going to your radio. Now, just a minute, Homer. I'm afraid that's out of the question. It is? And besides, it's your parents' turn to look after the party tonight. But neither of them plays the piano. Well, dear, would this help you? There's a neighbor of ours who has a portable phonograph and a complete collection of records. Oh, boy. I'll send Henry over to borrow them. You will, Mother? Okay, but will you tell him to hurry? Half the kids are here. Yes, Homer. And if we don't get something to dance to, I'll never get Willie out of the punch bowl. All right, Homer. Goodbye. Mother, you mean I have to start running errands at a time like this? Just over to Miss Spencer's to pick up her phonograph and records. Homer needs something to dance to. Boy, I always have to wait on him. Hand and foot. Dear, you're not doing this for Homer. You're doing it for your father and me. And I thought you were taking a bath. I decided I didn't have time. I'd only keep Diane waiting. Well, here's your overcoat. <coughs> Thanks, Mother. Uh, dear, don't forget to put your gloves on. Okay. And have a good time. Thanks, Mother. You and Father have a good time, too. We will. Goodbye. Goodbye. Was that Henry leaving, Alice? Yes, Sam. Well, thank goodness. Oh, dear. Hello? Hello, is that Mrs. Aldrich? Yes. Well, well, I'm very sorry to bother you, but this is Diane. Diane? Yes, Diane Conway. I'm going to a party tonight with your son, Henry. Oh, of course, and he's certainly looking forward to it. Oh, so am I. And so are we. That is... Uh, <coughs> Do you happen to know whether Henry is picking me up at home or at the Haven's drugstore? Well, didn't he tell you? Oh, yes, he did, I think. You know how when Henry tells you something, one minute it's perfectly clear, and the next minute, you know what I mean? Well, dear, I'm not sure, but he just left, and I was under the impression he was going to pick you up at your house. Oh, my goodness, he can't do that. Well, where are you now, Diane? I'm waiting down here at the drugstore. Well, then, suppose you go back home and wait for him. But by the time I go all the way home, I'll miss him. Well, and I can't stay here. Everybody's staring at me. Now, dear, just calm down. I know what we can do. You wait right where you are. Mrs. It'll only be for five minutes. Goodbye. Sam. Yes, Alice? Will you please come here a minute? What's the trouble now? Here's your coat, dear. My coat? I'm not going anyplace. Sam, don't argue.
you. You'll have to go down to the Haven's drugstore before that child goes to pieces. What child? Diane. For the sake of our whole evening, Sam, you'll have to pick her up. Pick her up? And what? There we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Henry, where have you been? I've been slightly delayed, Homer, but I'll be right over to your place. But, Henry, I thought you weren't coming, and I talked everybody out of dancing. But, Homer, you... So what do you say we go someplace? After I've gone to all the trouble of getting you a phonograph and records? What records have you got? Well, I'll tell you. Listen, Homer, how would the gang feel about Schubert's A? Who's A? Schubert, Schubert. Yeah, his A what? Symphony, Homer. Haven't you ever heard of the Unfinished Symphony? Listen, Henry, why would we want to listen to that? I know, but... Even Schubert wasn't interested enough to finish it. <laughs> but, Homer, that's the only kind of records Miss Spencer has. Well, it's a good thing we're not dancing. Look, why don't we all go over to your place? My place? I mentioned it to your mother before, but I don't think she took the hint. Now, listen, if you're planning to go over to my house, you're crazy. What do you mean by a statement like that? Homer, my folks are going to have one peaceful evening at home if it's the last thing I do. <laughs> Hello, Alice. Sam, where are you? Down at the Haven's Drugstore. And Alice, what does Diane look like? Well, I'm not sure, dear, but I believe Henry mentioned something about blue eyes. What kind of a description is that? What's she wearing? Sam, I hadn't any idea. Although... Yes? It's pretty cold. She's probably wearing a fur coat. You think so? If she has one. Although, frankly, I doubt it. Alice, I'm coming home. Dear, you can't do that. Diane's waiting for you. She isn't waiting here. Then you better run over to Hilliard's drugstore and take a look around there. That's all the way across town. Sam, we can't leave a single stone unturned. Alice, how nice of you to phone. Elizabeth, do you happen to know what Diane looks like? Diane? Yes, Henry's girl. Sam's down at Hilliard's drugstore looking for her, and we haven't the faintest idea what she looks like. Oh, Diane. Well, as a matter of fact, Homer was talking about her at supper tonight. Really? What did he say about her? <laughs> he said she was a dish. A dish? Yes, dear. You know, a Lulu. Well, that's some help. Homer didn't mention exactly where Henry was to meet her, did he? Well, Homer claims that all Henry talked about was somebody named Schubert. Schubert? Yes, and the number was eight. Oh, and Alice. Yes? Well, since Sam is down at the drugstore and he has to go by here on his way home, do you think he'd mind picking up a quart of ice cream? Oh, I guess not. And a tube of toothpaste while he's at it? Oh, all right, Elizabeth. And, Alice, I still think this idea of yours is a stroke of genius. Uh, you mean about the party? Yes. Will and I can bear up tonight as long as we know that next week at this time we'll be in your shoes. <laughs> Say, Charlie. Yeah? You see that fellow standing over there by the soda fountain? The one with his hat pulled down over his eyes? Yeah. Keep an eye on him. Why? What's he doing? Well, every girl that comes in here, he steps up to her, see, and stares at her. Yeah? What do you suppose he's up to? Wait a minute. I'll handle him. <coughs> oh, uh, sir. You there. Is there something I can show you? Uh, what, sir? May I help you? Why, uh, as a matter of fact, yes, I might want to buy something. Fine. Are you interested in reading? I was, earlier this evening. Well, then, how about a good book? A book? Uh, why, all right. We have a complete collection of pocketbooks right here. Uh, yes. You well, just look over the titles and let me know which one you'd like. Well, now, then, let's see. Here's one. Yes. Little Man, What Now? <laughs> Diane, are you sure this is where that friend of your mother's lives? Of course, Henry. And she has positively every kind of record. She has, Diane? All popular? I'm sure of it, Henry. Oh, boy, Diane. It's a lucky thing I saw you waiting there in the Haven's drugstore. The only thing is... Yes? 
Well, either your friend's out or she sleeps awfully hard. Let's try the doorbell again. I've got a better idea. What are you picking up, Henry? Some gravel. Stand back, Diane. My goodness, are you going to throw it at the window? Just gently. Do you hear anything? No, gee whiz. Henry, I think we'd better give up and get to the party. Give up? Why, if I don't get some dance records, do you know what Homer's going to do? Why? Land right on top of my parents with all four feet. Really? Sure, punch bowl and all. And can't you see what a mess that would make of their quiet evening at home? My goodness, Henry. I think you're about the most thoughtful boy I ever met. Gee, thanks. I'm going to have one more shot at that window. My, how many other boys would go to all this trouble? <laughs> Gee, thanks. <clears throat> Give me some elbow room, Diane. There. Oh, boy. Henry! How did that rock get in with the gravel? <laughs> I'm calling to tell you this whole thing is utterly ridiculous. Now, Sam Diane's waiting for someone to meet her in a drugstore, and I promise But, Alice, her... it's getting embarrassing looking into girls' eyes to see what color they are. But, dear... I've never felt more like a criminal in my life. What do you mean? At Hilliard's, they threatened to call the police. And at Marshall's, they came right out and called me a masher. You mean you've been to every drugstore in town? I have. Well, there is there a Schubert's drugstore on 8th Street? What's that? According to Homer, Henry talked about Schubert's at 8th. Alice, there's no such place. Dear, you'd better have a look. Now, wait. And while you're there, Mrs. Brown would like a quart of ice cream. Now, wait. And a tube of toothpaste. And you better get a dozen lemons, Sam, in case they run out of punch. Now, wait a minute. That's the first half of the Aldridge family from uh, December 16th of 1948. There's a, uh, a slight uh, defect in the sound on this. Uh, you listen to the show a little bit and you forget about it, but it's still there. And uh, um, some of these Aldridge family programs with the Jell-O commercials are hard to find. We've got a number of the Armed Forces ones, but with the Henry and Homer singing the Jell-O jingle and all that, it's kind of tough to find. That's why we have this one for you. But it's not you. It is, uh, it is on the tape. Apparently, the person who recorded this initially um, was getting some kind of a distortion uh, or interference of there. It sounds like little kilocycles or something, little kilocycle riding by there, a two or three wheel kilocycle going by. <laughs> I don't know. We'll get back to the Aldridge family in just a bit. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is our Those With a Days program coming to you every Saturday on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. When this tune was popular back in 1931, Norm Nelson and Ralph Hirschberg opened their Ford Automobile Agency on a small piece of land at 5133 West Irving Park Road. That first year, they sold about 100 new Fords. Today, 47 years and thousands and thousands of new Fords later, Nelson Hirschberg Ford occupies a whole city block at the same location on Irving Park Road at Laramie. And thousands of Chicagoland families have not only bought their first Ford from Nelson Hirschberg, but have returned again and again for all their new Fords. The proof is in the scene. Next time you're out for a drive, notice how many Fords bear the Nelson Hirschberg emblem. And you'll notice how many drivers have seen Nelson Hirschberg, one of Chicagoland's oldest, most respected Ford dealers. 5133 West Irving Park Road at Laramie. Open seven days a week, Monday through Friday till 9, Saturday and Sunday to 5. Nelson Hirschberg Ford, Irving Park at Laramie. Had an interesting experience this last week. I was having lunch with uh, Ralph, uh, with uh, Jurgen Hirschberg from uh, Nelson Hirschberg, and uh, into the restaurant uh, we were sitting there. And in the restaurant, a man and his wife and his son came over. They had known uh, Jurgen Hirschberg, and uh, and they introduced me to this couple. And the fellow says, "Oh, for heaven's sake! I listen to you all the time. In, you know, I listen to the program." He says. I, every Saturday afternoon, he says, while I'm working, while I'm working, I listen to your show. He says, Jurgen, you tell him later on what I do for a living. He said, but I listen faithfully every Saturday afternoon and all that other business that goes with Then they went. And I said, well, what does this fellow do? And uh, Jurgen Hershberg said, he's a, he's a funeral director. <laughs> and he, uh, 
he uh, in the course of his trade he must Im you know perform certain embalming things <laughs> and he, he listens on Saturday afternoon uh, applying his trade and I thought oh well that's a that's a new one on me I've heard you know people have said they're paneling rec rooms or working on jigsaw puzzles or painting or doing any number of things but I've that's a new one on me a, a funeral director uh, uh, making a living uh, while he's uh well, listening to this, and it occurred to me then, of all the, all of the mystery shows that we've played, you know, Inner Sanctum and the bodies and the cor <laughs> corpses and the, woo! <laughs> it was kind of a nice little, uh, well, I guess it was anyway. It was, uh, we, we're glad to get every listener that we can, dead or alive, I guess. <laughs> Those were the days. Now let's, uh, <laughs> let's get back to the Aldridge family. And now for some shopping instructions from Meredith Wilson and his talking people. The talking people, you've been talking about the Jell-O family since last October, and you're getting pretty darn good. Oh, sure. We can laugh together. Ho-ho! <laughs> and we can cry together. <laughs> and we can shimmer together. Starting with strawberry. Raspberry. Cherry. Mistake. How's that? Well, uh, hardly ever. And nobody makes a mistake when they ask for the famous Jell-O family of dessert. No, sir. There's regular Jell-O pudding, smooth and luscious. And Jell-O tapioca pudding. Full of personality. And dimples. And there's Jell-O. The world's most famous shimmering dessert. So colorful for your holiday table. Uh, better have plenty on hand because Jell-O is easy to prepare and it's so doggone good. Get Jell-O with the big red letters on the box in all six of those shimmering, delicious flavors. Starting with strawberry, cherry, lemon, lime, orange, 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 getting back to the troubles of Henry Aldridge. In order to ensure the quiet evening they had planned on spending at home, Mr. and Mrs. Aldridge are trying to get Henry off to a party. But the more they try, the further they get from their goal. The scene opens in Springer's hardware store. It is a little later the same evening. It is, operator. The line's still busy. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Well, look, could you cut in on the conversation? No, sir. I'm but look, operator, it's only my mother speaking, see, and I'm her son. I beg your pardon? Her only son, see, and I know she'd want to talk to me, and we pay our bill regularly every month. I beg your pardon? Sure, so couldn't you please cut in? I'll try your number again and call you back. I know, but you... Hello? Oh, boy. Henry! You want me to wrap these for you? The only thing is, Mr. Springer, I should speak to my mother first. Now, look. When you got me out of bed to come down here and open my hardware store, you didn't say you were dragging your mother into it. I'm not, Mr. Springer. Gee, I wouldn't think of dragging her out of the house when she's spending a nice, restful evening. Oh, boy. Excuse me. Hello, operator. Henry, is that you? Gee whiz, mother. Yes. You. Down at Springer's Hardware. And, and look, could I charge a small item or two to Father? Uh, but Just dear... a window pane and some putty. Henry, what for? You mean you want to go into all the boring, uninteresting details now? Yes, dear. But I'm right here in the store with Mr. Springer in a nightshirt. Henry, you wearing what? No, it's Mr. Springer, see, and he's shivering. So won't you please say yes? Well... Gee, thanks, Mother. You can wrap them up, Mr. Springer. And another thing, Mother... Yes, dear. Well, I got sort of separated from Diane, see? You mean you found her? Sure, Mother. Only I lost her again. When the window broke, we both had to run. So would you mind phoning her folks for me and see if she went home? My goodness. And then would you please phone Homer and tell him I'm practically on my way to the party? But Henry... All I have to do now is repair a little something and find Diane and round up some records, and then I'm all set. <laughs> Hello? Hello, Alice? Sam, where are you now? I'm phoning from Schubert's Delicatessen. Where? Schubert's Delicatessen. 
It's on the south side of town. Here, what are you doing there? What am I doing? I'm looking for Diane. But, Sam... And this ice cream is beginning to melt. Oh, mister... Oh, just a minute, Alice. Mister, did I hear you say you were looking for Diane? Why, yes. I'll tell her you're here. You mean she's... You mean she's... Uh, hello, Alice. Yes, Sam? Alice, I found Diane. Well, thank goodness. Henry will be so happy. Just take her and the ice cream and the lemons and the toothpaste straight over to the party at home. Very well. And, Sam, I just phoned Diane's parents, and they're terribly upset. What about? Well, they thought she was lost. So will you please stop by a drugstore again and buy some spirits of ammonia for Diane's mother? Diane's mother? Yes, dear, she's been having hysterics. Good heaven. And hurry, Sam. Goodbye. Diane will be right with you, mister, as soon as she's through waiting on that table. What's that? Now, hold on. Uh, there must be a mistake. While you're waiting, what kind of meat do you like? Meat? Sure, Diane's boyfriends always buy something. I am not one of Diane's boyfriends. Sure, Mr. Sure. Now, what kind of meat do you like? ice cream. We got enough to do sweeping out these streetcars without people traipsing through and dripping <laughs> milk. Well, look, look, suppose I just sit down here where I'll be out of your way. Can't sit there. Why not? That's the motorman's seat. I don't intend starting your streetcar. Just the same, you can't sit there. Company rules. <laughs> all right, all right. May I just ask you a simple question? Last time a layman sat on the motorman's seat, there was trouble. <laughs> Well, look, you have a lost and found department down here at the car barns, haven't you? It wasn't the lost and found. What wasn't? Well, I run the thing right off the tracks and smack into cafeteria. <laughs> look, I'm not interested in your cafeteria. It's closed anyway. <laughs> May I just ask one simple question? I don't see why not. Well, now, look, a little while ago, my son was riding on a streetcar. This streetcar? I don't know what streetcar. It doesn't matter what streetcar. The point is... Mr. Uh, yes? You're dripping in my dirt again. <laughs> I'm very sorry. The point is, he had a phonograph. On the streetcar? Of course, on the streetcar. Can't play music on the streetcar. No. Company rules. <laughs> he wasn't playing it. He was carrying it. That is, he set it down, and when he picked it up, he had a typewriter. Is that so? <laughs> yes. Sounds like a good trick. <laughs> Oh, it was very simple. Someone else took his phonograph. I, I know a few good tricks myself. 
Take a number. What? Any number. Go on. Uh, now, wait. All I want to know is this. Was a phonograph turned in here this evening? A phonograph? Yes, belonging to my son. Oh, you're trying to find your son's phonograph. Yes. Why didn't you say so? You mean <laughs> there was one turned in? Oh, say, look at that time. Was there? Sorry, mister. Time for me to go home. What? You tell your story to the night man. I... No, wait a minute. <laughs> the footstool over for you, Sam? Or bring you your slippers? Alice, there's only one thing you can bring me. Yes, dear, what is it? A large spoon. A spoon? Yes, I'm going to eat this ice cream. Dear, you mean you didn't take it over to the Browns? Under the circumstances, I did not go near the Browns. But, dear, what about Elizabeth's toothpaste? All my life, I've wanted to eat a whole quart of ice cream, and now I'm going to sit here quietly by the fire with my book and enjoy myself. Of course, dear. Wouldn't you like me to bring you a straw? Never mind. I'll just drink it. Oh, here, you can take this out to the kitchen. What is it? Salami. Salami? Diane's boyfriends always buy something. My goodness. Alice, what's the racket upstairs? It's Henry, dear. Henry, isn't he at the party? He can't find the party. They all left Homer's house for the Havens, and where they went from there, nobody knows. So Henry's up in his room typing. Typing? He's decided to give up society and write a book. He has my wholehearted cooperation. But, dear, what are we going to do about the lost phonograph? Henry can pay for it when he sells his book. Now, Sam. Alice, we'll worry about that tomorrow. Right now, all I want to do is to sit back and put my feet up and relax. You go right ahead, dear. Uh, uh. Alice, don't move. Sam, there's someone at the door. I know there is, but don't move. This is our quiet night at home. <laughs> Anybody home? Hello! Alice, who's there? I haven't the slightest idea. Is it on George? Well, well. Hello there, Mr. Aldrich. Well, uh, uh, hello. Oh, Alice, this is Mr. and Mrs. Conway, Diane's parents. So glad to meet you, Nice to meet you, Aldrich. Oh, Mr. Aldrich, I can't begin to thank you for all you've done for Diane this evening. Uh, I don't mind telling you we were pretty worried about her for a while. But now that the children are all having such a lovely party over at our house, we felt we should drop by and say thank you. Well, you're quite welcome. And since we've never met you before, Mrs. Aldrich, Cora thought it would be nice if we really got acquainted. So I'd move that chair over a little closer. Uh, we thought the four of us could sort of have our own little party. <laughs> well. Yes. Well. Well. <laughs> Isn't that grand? Henry, does your family hang up their stockings on Christmas Eve? Gee whiz, Homer, who'd want to do a childish thing like that? Okay, Henry, okay, but I'd just like to point out one thing. What, Homer? It may be childish. But think of all the extra surprise presents you get. Right, and say, here's a surprise package for your holiday meals. The new Jell-O rice pudding, newest member of the famous Jell-O family. There was never anything quite like it before. Jell-O pudding, the 10-minute marvel. All you do is add milk and boil gently for 10 minutes. No fussy mixing, no bothersome custard to make, no cooking for hours on end. And you get rice pudding so delicious, even expert cooks are amazed. Super rich, gloriously creamy, with real honest-to-goodness homemade flavor. You can have it plainer, fancy, thick or thin, however you like it best. And once you've tried Jell-O rice pudding, you'll never make rice pudding any other way. So buy it. Try it. The 10-Minute Marvel, the new Jell-O rice pudding. <laughs> Here's hoping you'll be in your living room and ours next week at the same time. Good night, folks. The Aldrich Family, starring Ezra Stone as Henry with Jackie Kelk as Homer, is written by Patricia Jowdry and Del Dinsdale with music by Jack Miller. Mr. and Mrs. Aldrich are House Jameson and Catherine Roth. And this is Dan Seymour in New York saying, The Aldrich Family is brought to you by the Jell-O Family. For desserts that are delicious. 
Boy, believe me, you should know. They are made by famous J-E-L-L-R. Stay tuned now for the Burns and Allen Show and their special guest tonight, Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Cole. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. No chimes on that show from December 16th of 1948. Stay tuned for Burns. Reprint articles about Fibber McGee and Molly, the cast of Radio's Gunsmoke, and Vic and Sade. Original articles, too, about Jack Teagarden, science fiction movies, and the roots of Chicago radio broadcasting. Very good article there by Otto Stack. It's all yours when you get a one-year subscription to the Nostalgia Newsletter. Ten issues for only $7. You can subscribe right now when you call 545-2260. That's 545-2260. Our newsletter gives you the complete lineup of the good old shows we broadcast every Saturday afternoon, including original broadcast dates and the length of each segment we program, plus the list of memory movies you can see every Saturday night at Northwest Federal, and that uh, the new season begins tonight with Animal Crackers from 1930. 545-2260 is our number. Give us a call now. We'll get your subscription rolling right away, and we'll include an invoice along with your first issue. If you like, you can send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But why not give us a call this afternoon at 545 22 Six oh, you'll have the February issue of the Nostalgia Newsletter in your hands before the 1st of February. If you get a busy signal when you call, won't you wait just a moment and then call back at 545-2260. 545-2260. It only happens once a year, and it's happening right now. Hi, this is Carmelita Pope with big money-saving news. Magicus two-for-one cleaning sale is in progress. You can have two rooms of carpeting cleaned in your home or office and pay only for the larger. You can have two rugs cleaned and pay only for the larger. You can have two pieces of furniture cleaned or two sets of draperies cleaned. And you only pay for the larger. Don't miss out on these savings. If you're a little short of cash, use your Master Charge or Bank AmeriCard. But call now. Magicist is very busy during the sale, and they don't want you to be disappointed. Yes, it only happens once a year, but once is enough if you act now. Call Magicist. Chicago phones 378-8600. That's 378-8600. Suburbs see the white pages. Get Magicist soil retardant, only three cents a square foot. I'm Chuck Shaden. Our Those Were the Days program on WNIB continues now as we go back to February 23rd of 1948, almost exactly um, about a month shy of 30 years ago, for a program called Diary of Fate. It was a transcribed program syndicated to radio stations across the country, and uh, Fate himself... Um, uh, talks, uh, narrates the program in his uh, diary. He tells, it's like an entry in the diary. This is the Peter Drake entry, and I guess taking a page from Carlton E. Morse, he calls this book 84, page 387. Let's tune in now to Diary of Fate. <laughs> Fate plays no favorite. It could happen to you. Book 84, page 327. In the Diary of Fate. Yes, here it is. The name Peter Drake. Occupation, treasurer of Lewis Swirdling and Company. A comfortable life for a man of your temperament, wasn't it, Peter? A life that required few important decisions. An occupation that dealt primarily with numbers. 
you would have gone on in your work secure and contented. Had it not been for your wife, Marcia, she was blindly proud and avaricious. But you loved her, didn't you, Peter? Because of that love, you stand now in the bedroom of your home, the muzzle of a pistol pressed against your temple. And in less than a minute, you will be dead. Soon I will write the final entry under the name Peter Drake. When I have written, I shall read from his record in The Diary of Fate. I hope you'll understand. Peter Drake, it was your unreasoning love for your wife that forced you from the security of your world of numbers, and it was the impelling power of her greedy ambition that drove you to a grim decision, the most important decision of your life, but the ultimate outcome was determined by a little thing. So commonplace and innocent that you failed to notice it that night when you stealthily stepped into your cousin's room. Hello, Arthur. Peter, what are you doing sneaking in here at this hour? Why, are you drunk? You're working late, Arthur. Are you worried? Well, yes, I am. I, I don't know what to do. I do. I know the answer, Arthur. And this is your last chance. I'll tell you if you'll make me a partner. So that's why you came here. No, get out of here. Go on, get out. Oh, no. Not yet, Arthur. What are you doing? Drop that gun. Since when do you keep your gun on your desk? Afraid of burglars, Arthur? No, Peter, please. Give me back my gun. Sit down, Arthur. There, at the desk. What are you going to do, Peter? No! No! <laughs> As you fired that shot, Peter Drake, a plan was put in motion, and the end for you was certain. At that moment, I, fate, moved unnoticed into your life. Little things, a moment's hesitation, a sudden rainstorm, a lost wallet. These are the tools with which I work let us turn back to the point where it all began. The country club dance. Marcia had planned on the occasion for weeks. Regarded it as an important social opportunity. And yet, it was only half over and you were on your way home. I can't understand you, Marcia. You talk about nothing but that dance for a month and then for no apparent reason you want to leave in the middle of it. No apparent reason. Are you blind? What was the matter? I'll tell you. Very simple language. I've never been so completely humiliated in my life. Thurman and Arthur Swerdling and their fat wives at a table with the governor. And we seated at the other end of the hall with that, with that obnoxious Mr. Ross. Oh, Ross isn't a bad sort, Marcia. He's a fool. And a nobody. And so are the rest of the people at our table. Complete nobody. Well, Cousin Thurman's wife made certain of that. Harriet, don't be absurd. She's jealous of me. She made sure I wasn't on the awards committee, nor the receiving line, nor anything else that might have put me in the public eye. Marcia, darling, we've been over the same thing a thousand times. And I'm fed up with it. Sick and tired of being pushed around by the mighty squirtling. We've got to be patient, Marcia. Uncle Lewis left the business to Thurman and Arthur, not to me. And the poor nephew became treasure. Remained treasure for six years. You're brilliant, Peter. You're too smart to say treasure. You have more brains than the two of them. You should be a partner. Please, Marcia. Then let them try to snub and slight and look down their noses. Do something about it. Demand it. You've got to, Peter. You've got to become a partner. <laughs> Peter, 
You felt the security of your sheltered world crumble before the insistent nagging of your wife, whom you love deeply. You would do as Marcia asked. You had even begun to believe she was right when an hour after you arrived at your office the next morning, you boldly entered the office occupied by your cousins, Thurman and Arthur. You uh, left the party early last night, Peter. Anything wrong? No, I had a headache, that's all. Well, too bad. Nice party. Well, Peter, uh, what do you want to see me about? Does her account? No, Thurman, that's been taken care of. I want to talk about my position here. I'm not satisfied, Thurman. Well, what do you mean, Peter? Just this. I want to be taken in on equal footing. I want to be up there with you and Arthur. What are you talking about? I'll handle this now, Arthur. Now, look, Peter. As a treasurer, you're tops. Keeping books, watching expenses, that sort of thing. That's what you're best suited for. But as far as making the big deals, handling our delicate foreign commitments, well, <laughs> you're still a good treasurer. Look here, Thurman. I've made big money for this company for years. I handled our war contracts. I established our overseas trade. Yes, you've always done your job well, Peter. There's no question about that. But no one man is indispensable. Now, don't forget that. And don't force my hand, Peter. You mean... You mean you'd fire me? Now, now let's be sensible about this. Right now, there's nothing open. Arthur and I can handle the whole show. We need you. We want you. Exactly where you are. I think we understand each other. Now, is there anything else? No, Thurman. Nothing else. Very well. Then let's forget it. Yes, Marcia, I talked to Thurman and Arthur. Things look much better. I am confident that soon... How soon, Peter? Oh, I don't know. It all depends. They both agree my work has done the firm a lot of good. Did they say anything specific? Well, they said they're not quite ready yet, but when things pick up... Oh, Peter, they're stalling you. And they'll keep on stalling you forever. Well, I'm tired of waiting. I'm not going to wait. What do you mean? I mean I'm through. For six years, I've been insulted and looked down on by this word. I can't take any more. I'm through, I tell you. Through. Marcia, Marcia, you don't mean that. You can't leave me. Peter, you're hurting my arm. You can't leave me, do you hear? I won't let you. I love you, Marcia. I love you so much, but I'd do anything. My arm, Peter. Please, Marcia, you've got to give me more time. You'd need a whole lifetime. Harriet and Bertha are afraid of me. They'll see that you never get in. I will. I swear I will. But I need time. I love you so, darling. Please, please give me time. All right, Peter. I'll give you six months. Frankly, I think it's a waste of time. You'll get into the firm only when the Swerdling brothers are dead and buried. By that time, I'll be too old to care. Yes, Peter. Your wife had issued an ultimatum. You were forced to a decision. All that night, her words raced through your tortured mind. And by morning, you had reached your decision and established your plan. At the office, you said no more about a partnership. You did your work patiently and quietly. Several weeks went by, and when your chance came, you seized it. You had taken the monthly report into Thurman's office. What's this? Oh, monthly report, eh? Well, thank you, Peter. Congratulations, my boy. That Desser thing was a nice piece of work. Thanks, Thurman. It did work out well, didn't it? Uh, would you like to go over the report? No, no. I'm sure it's in fine shape. You just leave it on the desk. By the way, uh, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm all right. I've been getting a little outdoor exercise lately, and... Oh, uh, incidentally, Herman, perhaps you'd like to come with me tomorrow. Where? Duck hunting. Uh, you used to be a pretty good shot, and uh, I have an excellent place up on the lake. Well, <laughs> sounds great, Peter. I'd like nothing better. But uh, I've got a golf date with Larry Colepack tomorrow. 
Maybe some other time. Okay, but uh, if you have any questions on the report, I'll, I'll be in the office all afternoon. Uh, just a minute. Yes, Thurman? Uh, about this duck shoot. Uh, could we be back by noon? Yes, if we leave early, say about 4.30. All right, George, I'll do it. You uh, pick me up at 4.30. Fine. I'll pick you up at your house. Good, good. Uh, better sharpen your sights, boy. You're going to have to go some to beat me. I'll be gunning with a vengeance. Don't worry, Thurman. So will I. What's the matter, Peter? You're, you're shivering. I'm freezing. Aren't you cold? Oh, I like it. Ah, it's invigorating. How'd you ever find this place? Not another soul in sight. Uh-oh. Here they come. It's your shot, Peter. Oh, you missed again. It's this gun. There's something wrong. I, I can't seem to get the right trigger for you. Uh, maybe it's these gloves. <laughs> Blame the gun, the cold, even the ducks. But never the hunter, huh? <laughs> uh, you can't get away with that. I've got four already. Uh, take your gloves off like I did. Don't have to. I, I still think it's the gun. Uh, let's trade and see how we do. You're using the heavier shot, you know. All right, here. Yeah. Oh, hurry up. Here they come again. Thurman, turn around. Peter, stop joking. Don't point that gun at me. I'm not joking, Thurman. I'm going to kill you with your own gun. No, Peter, you, you're out of your mind. You'll never get away with this. Please, Peter. Listen to me. You thought I kept my gloves on because I was cold. No, no, Thurman. Only your prince will be on this gun. I'm going to blow your stomach wide open. No, Peter. No. It'll be an accident. No. Now pray, Thurman. Pray. No. Yes, Peter Drake. In the cold of the morning, you killed a man. Goaded on by the whiplash tongue of the woman you loved, you committed murder. Now, Peter, the plan was finished, complete. The end for you ordained. There was no turning back. Now there are many entries to be made. Soon I will record them all in The Diary of Fate. <laughs> And that's the first half of the Peter Drake entry, book 84, page 327. Gave you the wrong page before, as if it mattered. On the Diary of Fate from uh, February 23rd of 1948. More of that in just a moment or so. Chuck Shaden here with a hall closet full of old-time radio shows on our Those Were the Days program Saturdays on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. I want to remind you again about the big sale that's going on now at our Metro Golden Memory Shop. You can save 10% or more on anything in our store. That's right. If you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop between now, this very minute, and January 31st, you'll find some good old savings along with all the good old memories we have for you. Everything in the shop will be offered to you at a 10% discount or more, and that means you can save a big 10% on all records, all of the big band, the old-time radio, or the personality recordings that we have, all the cassettes, the old-time radio programs on cassette or 8-track tapes. The only one not reduced is our current uh, cassette of the month, which is already at a low $5. We have books and magazines, cards, gifts, and novelties, all for 10% off between now and January 31st at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. And you can save even bigger on some special items at the shop. We have a good supply of those original Armed Forces radio transcription discs. That's the large 16-inch disc. You can save 50% on those during this special uh, discount sale. They regularly sell for $5 each. They're yours for only $2.50. And I think you'll find that those radio transcriptions will look great on your rec room wall. Now, you would have to have a large uh, transcription turntable to play one of them. But uh, for $2.50, it's a nice souvenir of an era that's gone, but certainly, as far as we're concerned, not forgotten. 
You'll have um, lots of fun and you'll save lots of loot when you shop our special discount sale now through January 31st at the Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. When you come in, you don't have to buy anything, but be sure you register for our drawing. We're going to give away 10 $10 MGM Shop gift certificates. The drawing will be held on February the 1st, and uh, winners will be notified. You can come back then and have a shopping spree at the MGM Shop. Also, make sure when you come in to ask for your Nostalgia Party Planner. It's Chuck Shaden's Nostalgia Party Planner, a booklet that will help you uh, plan for a, a party at your place. Whether you're going to have uh, uh, a party in honor of the Roaring Twenties or the Hard Times Thirties, the Frantic Forties or the Fabulous Fifties, this little party planner will come in handy. Um, a page of trivia questions in there and some good suggestions and ideas for you too. So pop into the MGM shop. We're open every day Monday through Friday from 11 to 5.30. Saturdays from 10 to 7.30. We're open right now. You can maybe even come in late this afternoon or early this evening on your way to the Memory Movie at Northwest Federal. Or tomorrow Sunday, come in from noon till 5 o'clock. We will be there tomorrow to help wrap up your 10% discount purchases. Every item in the store on sale for 10% or more, including many super discount specials. So come in and save. Your Master Charge, Visa, or Bank AmeriCard is welcome at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Now let's return to the Diary of Fate. Yes, Peter Drake. You were convincing with your story of how Thurman met his death. Only his fingerprints were on the gun. And it substantiated your story of how he held the gun by the barrel while he tapped the loose oarlock with the butt when the gun accidentally discharged. You had seen to it that the marks of the oarlock were on the butt, put there after his death. And it was marked down as another hunting casualty. And you can clearly recall shortly after Thurman was buried when you entered Arthur's office, confident that now your long scheduled promotion was a certainty. Arthur, why didn't you speak to me before you signed this thing? I could have smelled that trick a mile away. It's only been a month since Thurman's accident, and you get us into a jam like this. The point is, I didn't ask you. And I am asking you now. What shall we do? Make me a partner, Arthur, and I can give you all the answers. This isn't the time, Peter. Time? You're hedging, Arthur. You know as well as I do you need me here. I belong here. And the only reason I'm not is because your wife is jealous of Marcia. You shouldn't have said that, Peter. True or not, you shouldn't have said it. If I want your advice again, I'll call you. Good day. But if it's really that serious, Arthur has to give in, Peter. He's cornered. Not quite. He still thinks he can find the answer alone. And if he's not a complete fool, he can. Can't you do something to prevent that? To get him in deeper? Yeah. Juggle the books, you mean? Not a chance. You've got to do something. We'll never get another opportunity like this. When Thurman died, we got our big break. If you let this chance slip by There's without... nothing I can do about it, so forget it. There is a way to trap him. There must be. If you weren't such a coward, you'd find it. You dare call me that? What do you know about courage, Marcia? Marcia, this is going to be a shock to you. But do you suppose killing Thurman was easy? <gasps> Peter. Yes, Marcia, I murdered him. Shot him in the belly with his own gun. Now will you shut up and leave me alone? You. Everyone said it was an accident. And all this time... Peter, you've gone this far. You can't stop now. You've got to go ahead. No, Marcia, no, no, please. This is our chance. Work on the book. Ruin Arthur. Trap him. Stop it, stop it. Stop nagging, pushing, and forcing. In heaven's name, leave me alone and stop goading me. I can't stand anymore. I can't stand anymore, I tell you. Where are you going? Ow! I just got to have time to think. As you left, your mind was a turmoil of frustration. You were afraid to go on, and more afraid not to. Then, in a frantic effort to escape your thoughts, 
You went into a bar. The alcohol was warm inside you, and the churning in your brain quieted and finally stopped. Then you left and went straight to Arthur's house. A light burned in the library, and you watched through the French doors as Arthur sealed an envelope, laid it on the mantel. Stealthily, you opened the doors and stepped into the room. Hello, Arthur. Peter, what are you doing sneaking in here at this hour? Why, why, you're drunk. You're working late, Arthur. Are you worried? Yes, I am. I don't know what to do. I do. I know the answer, Arthur, and this is your last chance. I'll tell you if only you'll make me a partner. So that's why you came here. No. Now get out of here. Go on, get out. Oh, oh no. Not yet, Arthur. What are you doing? Drop that gun. Since when do you keep your gun on the desk? Afraid of burglars, Arthur? Now, Peter, please. Put that gun down. Sit down, Arthur. There at the desk. What are you going to do, Peter? No! No! Now, Peter Drake, you had killed again. You had murdered another man. Then you moved quickly. You wiped the fingerprints. Put the pistol in Arthur's right hand. Pushed his chair close to the desk and ran from the room. You hurried to your house where you found Marcia asleep. You got into bed at once. And you knew that now, at last, you would rule the swirdling empire. Now, Marcia would be happy. You didn't know how long you had slept before you were awakened by Marcia rushing into the room. Peter. Peter, wake up. Have you lost your mind completely? How much do you think you can get away with? Well, what, what's the matter? Here. Huh? It's all over the morning paper. Listen to this. Arthur Swerdling, dead. President of the Lewis Swerdling Company was found shot to death in the library of his home late last night. Did you do it, Peter? Yes. Yes, I did. Are you sure nobody saw you? No one saw me. It all happened so fast. I... What about this? Although there was every indication Swerdling killed himself, police were silent about a single clue, which indicates that someone else may have done a the clue? Case. Oh, no, Marsha. What could it be? Peter, listen to me. You've got to get to the office quick. Make believe that nothing has happened. You didn't see the morning paper. Oh, a clue, a clue. If only I could remember. Get hold of yourself. You've got to hurry. Yes, yes, yes. I... No, I'm so shaky. I'll call a cab while you dress. Hurry. <laughs> As you rode in the taxi to your office, the fatal words drummed over and over in your brain. The police were silent about a single clue. Yes, Peter, they had found something, and the cold terror of what that meant to you made your fingers tremble as you reached for your wallet to pay the cab fare. Then, for an instant, your heart stopped beating. Your wallet was missing. Frantically, you searched through all your pockets. But it was gone. The awful fact descended over you like a shroud. You ran inside and called Martha. Had her look for it at home. Her voice was heavy with fear. as She told you it was not there. You had to find out. Had to know if your wallet was the clue. You decided to go back to Arthur's. And in a few moments later, as a wave of panic mounted inside you, you walked up to his door and pressed the bell. I, uh, I'm Peter Drake. I'd like to see Bertha. Uh, uh, Mrs. Swerdling. Were you a friend of Mrs. Swerdling's? Yes, a cousin. I'm the treasurer of this firm. Mrs. Swerdling's pretty broken up. She said she didn't want to see anybody. Oh, I understand, of course. Uh, may I ask who you are? Lieutenant Fitzsimmons, police department. Oh, I, uh, I read in the paper that you men had found some sort of clue. Uh, do you mind telling me well, what you found? I really couldn't say, Mr. Drake. <laughs> I couldn't go 
move back to the office, Marsha. Look at me. I'm shaking all over. And the police wouldn't tell me a thing. I didn't find your wallet, Peter. I looked everywhere. Huh? What am I going to do? Think, Peter. When did you have your wallet last? Uh, at that bar. I, I, I must have paid for my, my drinks last night. I... Peter. Peter, what's the matter? That man coming up the walk. He's the waiter. The one at the bar. And, and look at that tall man in back of him. It's the detective. I talked to him at Arthur's. Peter. Sure. Sure, it's simple now. They, they, they must have found my wallet in Arthur's library. They traced my movements. And that waiter, that waiter, he told him what time I left the bar. You can get away. Run, Peter. Out the back. Look, look, look. Stall him, will you? Stall him as long as you can. Where are you going? To the bedroom. Come on, go on. Answer the door. Mrs. Drake? Yes? I'm Lieutenant Fitzsimmons, Police Department. I'd like to talk to your husband in connection with the death of Arthur Swirling. He, uh, he's not feeling well. If you could come back... To the What's that? Peter! Oh, no! Oh! He's dead. <laughs> Killed himself. <laughs> Yes, Peter Drake is dead by his own hand. And justice has been served. Although the man is dead, I, fate, have still another entry to make in his record. And lest any mortal fail to understand my writing beyond this finality, I will add the reason. In a few moments, I will write again. And when I have written, I will read from the Diary of Fate. delicate scales of justice seek their equilibrium, do I, fate, move through the lives of mortal. Only when good has counterweighed evil do I rest. Remember that when the thought is born, the word spoken, the deed performed, the pen indicts. And having been written, the words are indelibly entered in the eternal ledger of the universe. Take heed, you who listen, that your decision be not for evil. For once the decision is made, there is no turning back. And if the decision be for evil, the end for you is certain. In the life of Peter Drake, the plan was set in motion with his decision. And the conclusion was inevitable. For him, self-destruction. Suicide? But why? Because, because he was cornered. Because you came after him for Arthur's murder. What? Yes. And he murdered Thurman, too. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Arthur Swerdling was a suicide. We found the note he left. What note? Arthur Swerdling left a suicide note on the mantel of his room. He confessed juggling the company's books. That's why I'm here. Your husband was the firm's treasurer, and I but, thought that... But the clue. You found a clue. Oh, that was nothing. It turned out to be a false lead. No. No, you're lying. What about the wallet? He lost his wallet. Yeah, yeah, he did that. This man just told me about it down at the door. Yeah, yeah, lady, that's right. You see, he lost it at my bar, and I just wanted to return it. I... I figured it was the honest thing to do. Now it is time to close the book. Another entry has been duly recorded on the pages of eternity. And the sensitive scales of justice are suspended in absolute balance. In the case of Peter Drake, as in the cases of all mortals, I, fate, am but the instrument. 
the instrument of a plan. And the little things that happen every day, the trivia of life, are the tools with which I work. It was a little thing, the innocent loss of a wallet, which magnified a thousandfold by Peter's complex of guilt, proved his undoing. Ponder well the moral, and remember, you who listen, that there is a page for you in The Diary of Faith. Produced by Larry Finley, Diary of Fate is a Finley transcription, brought to you from Hollywood. Fate from February 23rd of 1948, the Peter Drake entry narrated by Fate himself as he rather heavily made an entry in his <laughs> diary there. Chuck Shaden here with our Those Were the Days program, WNIB Chicago at FM 97, every Saturday from 1 to 5, all the good old shows for you. Maxwell House Coffee Time with George Burns and Gracie Allen and Rudy Valley coming up in just a couple of minutes and then... Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow, the shadow knows. Good mystery show, The Shadow. Speaking of mystery programs and intriguing broadcasts from the good old days, our cassette tape of the month for January features not one but two great lights-out broadcasts from the 1940s. Ironized yeast presents lights out everybody. <laughs> supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the terrors of the unknown. We tell you this frankly, so if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. Don't turn it off now, but boy, oh boy, what a warning. That's really had a lot of courage that uh, what was going to follow was going to be good. Well, no doubt about it, it was good. Art Jobler and his Lights Out program from the 1940s. We have two of them as our cassette tape for January, The Meteor Man and Until Dead. Two good stories back-to-back -back on a 60-minute cassette tape for January, $5, from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. The Meteor Man uh, puts uh, Star Wars and Close Encounters to shame, I think, uh, as you use your imagination in this uh, fantastic story from 1942. It's about a multitude of shooting stars that reach this planet, and one of those stars contains a growing flesh. The other story is called Until Dead, and it stars Frank Lovejoy. It's the story of a man found guilty of murdering his wife, but he believes that his friend killed his wife, and he swears that he'll break out of jail and kill him question uh, that is asked in this program is, can revenge go beyond the grave? It's a good story. Two good stories, as a matter of fact, from the fertile, imaginative mind of Arch Obler. Two Lights Out shows, they're new ones to uh, the collection, for your collection. Our cassette tape for January. Five dollars from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. If you like, you can get your tape at any of the six offices of Northwest Federal Savings, or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road. Until Dead and the Meteor Man, two lights out broadcasts from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Before we tune in to Burns and Ellen, I want to remind you again that tonight is the premiere night for our 1978 Memory Club get-together. 
Uh, the movie tonight is Animal Crackers from 1930. After uh, about a two-month break, um, well, actually less than that, about six weeks, uh, we broke for the holidays on the 5th of December, and then we're back tonight with uh, another season of good old movies. In the new auditorium now, there's a large, beautiful, comfortable auditorium at Northwest Federal Savings on Irving Park Road. It's the uh, Clyde B. Reed Auditorium, and um, it's 300 seats. Should be able to accommodate everyone who wants to come to see uh, animal crackers. There's no pillars in the auditorium. There's uh, The seating is on a sloped floor, so you'll have a perfect view of the gigantic screen, and uh, you'll find it most comfortable and very entertaining. So I hope you can join us tonight. Uh, the Memory Club is for anyone who enjoys the good old movies, and you're certainly invited. All seats are $1.25, payable at the door. Doors open at 7.30, and our film program, The uh, Marx Brothers and Animal Crackers, begins at 8 o'clock. If you, uh, you want to take the CTA, the bus uh, stops right at the door of Northwest Federal, then you just walk a little bit south alongside of the building and then west to the back entrance uh, from the parking lot. Uh, to the uh, Northwest Community Center. We'll be there tonight, and we hope that you'll join us for a lot of fun with the Marx Brothers, Harpo, uh, Groucho, Chico, and Zeppo, and Margaret Dumont. You'll see uh, Groucho go through Hooray for Captain Spaulding, one of the best pictures of all time by the Marx Brothers. Animal Crackers tonight, our memory movie at Northwest Federal Savings. Now here's a program that we had postponed twice already, uh, on these Saturday afternoon shows. Every time we had scheduled the Burns, this particular Burns and Allen program, something came up to um, uh, preempt it. We, uh, we uh, think at one time we had an interview with someone who had come to town, and we wanted to share that interview with you right away, so we bumped the Burns and Allen show. Then when we rescheduled it, it was scheduled for uh, a, a Saturday afternoon, and uh, it so happened that Bing Crosby passed away, and so we just took everything that we had scheduled that Saturday and presented our tribute to Bing. But lo and behold, for all of those Burns and Allen fans out there in Radio Land, we have nothing to deter us this afternoon as we go back to June 14th of 1949 for Maxwell House Coffee Time with Burns and Allen. Another cup of Maxwell House coffee, George? Sure, pour me a cup, Gracie. You know, Maxwell House is always good to the last <laughs> drop. That drop's good, too. Yes, it's Maxwell House Coffee Time, transcribed in Hollywood and starring George Burns and Gracie Allen. <laughs> With our special guest, Rudy Valley, yours truly, Toby Reed, Mary Lee Robb, Dick Crenna, Harry Lubin and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and... Bill Goodwin. For America's Thursday night comedy enjoyment, it's George and Gracie. And for America's everyday coffee drinking enjoyment, it's Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. <laughs> The Burns' next-door neighbors, the Vanderlips, are out of town for a few days, and their teenage daughter, Emily, has moved in with George and Gracie until her parents return. It's a balmy, romantic night in June as we go to the Burns' house, and Emily is on the front porch saying goodnight to her teenage boyfriend. Do you have to go in, Emily? Yes, Rudy. Mr. and Mrs. Burns are already asleep. Thanks for taking me to the Coconut Grove tonight. Gosh, that's all right. You paid your own way. <laughs> I didn't mind. Someday I'll have a better job and make more money. I won't always be third assistant soda jerk. You bet you won't. Someday you'll be the highest paid jerk in town. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Emily. I love the way you sang in my ear while we were dancing. I'm a lousy singer. <laughs> oh, I don't care. I loved it. And I love you, Rudy. I love you, Emily. And someday you'll be my wife. Mrs. Rudolph Schreckenhorst. <laughs> Mrs. Rudolph Schreckenhorst. That's beautiful. <laughs> what a honeymoon we'll have. In the distance, I can already hear the roar of Niagara Falls. That's Mr. Burns sleeping on his back. Oh. <laughs> I have to go in now, Rudy. Can I kiss you goodnight, Emily? If you want to. 
Fuck her up. <laughs> mm. Wow, kissing's fun. It'll even be more fun after we're married. Then you can kiss me on the forehead. I didn't know husbands kissed their wives on the forehead. Well, I didn't either until I moved in with the Burnses. <laughs> Rudy, I'm going in and write about you in my diary. Will you let me read your diary someday? Maybe. After I become Mrs. Rudolph Schreckenhorst. Mrs. Rudolph Schreckenhorst. That's beautiful. <laughs> yes. Good night, Rudy. Good night, Emily. I'll count the seconds while I'm away from you. Do that, Rudy. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Good morning, Gracie. How about some breakfast? Oh, George, I'm too upset to think about breakfast. Something terrible has happened to Emily. What's the matter? Well, after she left for school this morning, I found her diary and I read it. And hold it, it hold it. Huh? You shouldn't read Emily's diary. That isn't done. I know, but it's great as far as it goes. <laughs> Nice. I'll say it isn't. <laughs> you know what I found out? She's in love with Rudy Valley. What? It's true, George. Emily's been dating the hobo hugger. <laughs> hobo hugger? Tramp kisser? You mean vagabond lover? Yeah, that's, that's it. it. <laughs> hobo hugger. It's all right here in her diary. She and Rudy are engaged to be married. Oh, go. Little kid and a man old enough to be her father. <laughs> <laughs> that could never work. Well, I don't know, George. We've been very happy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't even date a high school kid. He's got thousands of women. He's a handsome guy. Yeah, he is handsome, except when he sings. You know, I saw him a long time ago in the theater, and when he sang, his lips stuck out like a Ubangi. You were singing through a megaphone. Yeah, oh. Oh. Rudy Valley is doing all right. You ought to read the article about him in the July Red Book magazine. What, what does it say? Well, it says that he's one of the great entertainers of all time. And it says that he's a sensation in nightclubs right now. Oh, you'd be even better. In fact, lots of people want to buy a nightclub just so they could give you a job. Really? Well, sure. Every time you sing, they say, oh, if I only had a club. <laughs> let's, uh, let's drop the whole subject. Um, I'm, I'm sure the Rudy in Emily's diary isn't Rudy Ballard. Well, I think it is, George. Let me read it to yes, you. Yes, I'd like to hear that. All right, now listen. <laughs> yeah. Had a date with Rudy tonight. It was wonderful. That could be anybody. While we danced, he sang to me. Poor Rudy, he can't carry a tune in a basket. <laughs> <laughs> That's beginning to sound like Valley, all right. <laughs> me to be his wife, someday I'll be married to the highest paid jerk in town. <laughs> Sounds even more like Valley now. <laughs> he took me to the Coconut Grove tonight. I had to pay my own way. It is Valley, yeah. break this thing up. We're responsible for that girl. Well, I know. I wish Emily's father were in town. Old Vandalip is a Yale man like Rudy. He could straighten everything out. How? He could appeal to Rudy. Well, I think Rudy would still prefer Emily. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, Yale men are very loyal to one another. George? Yeah? Why don't you go to Rudy and pose as Mr. Vandalip, the Yale man? I, uh, I wouldn't be convincing. I haven't had Vandalip's education. You went to school longer than he did. Honey, Vandalip went through grade school, high school, and college. 
I never got past the third grade. I know, but you went to school longer than he did. <laughs> I was the only third grader in PS 98 that shaved every day. Well, now Hollander was my teacher. Oh. I well, taught her how to do the Peabody. Well, now listen. Yes. George, you've just got to go to Rudy Valley and talk to him. Look, let's wait until Emily comes home from school this afternoon and talk to her. Well, that won't do any good, George. I know how she feels. When I was her age, I felt the same way about Rudy Valley. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's wait and see. I'm going in the kitchen to fix some breakfast. Let's see if I can fix some chicken. <laughs> well, if he won't be Mr. Vandalip, I'll be Mrs. Vandalip. Somebody's got to talk to Rudy Valley. <laughs> Oh, no, me miss a valley Chinese boy. Well. I didn't know he had married a Chinese girl. Um, tell your father I'd like to see him. No, no, not Mr. Valley's son. Just work for Mr. Valley. Oh, Wong, uh, Wong, would you run down to... Oh, how do you do? Well, hello, Mr. Valley. Don't just stand there, Wong. This attractive young lady has just come in from the heat of the day. Fetch a glass of champagne for Miss... Uh, Miss... It's Mrs. I'm married. Oh. Well, don't stand there, Wong. Bring her a glass of water. <laughs> no, Wong, don't bother. I, I'm just here to give Mr. Valley a piece of my mind, and that won't take long. <laughs> Excuse me. I gather that you've come to upbraid me. No, I'm not here to fix your hair. <laughs> I came to tell you that you've got to stop chasing Emily Vandalip. Emily Vandalip? Yes. I've dated a Jessica Vandalip, Clarissa Vandalip, also a Florence Vandalip, but Emily escapes me. Well, the next time she escapes, don't chase her. <laughs> she's too young and innocent. Why, I don't think she's even been kissed. You say I've dated her? Many times. She's been kissed. <laughs> And you should be ashamed of yourself. She's only 17. 17? Then I assure you I have not dated the girl. My conscience would never allow it, not to mention my attorneys. <laughs> oh, but you, you have dated her. She says so right in her diary. Now, it's got to stop. My daughter is too young for you. Emily is your daughter. Not only that, I'm her mother. <laughs> but you look too young to have a daughter, 17. Oh, I'm older than you think. Really? Oh, yes. I'll soon be 20. <laughs> you, uh, you can't believe it, huh? Well, hardly. How long have you been married? 15 years. <laughs> you were married at 5? No, I, I think it was about 3.30. <laughs> Just a moment. About this 17-year-old daughter, don't you have your figures mixed up? No, this is mine. She's wearing hers. <laughs> I mean, you can't possibly be 20. Married 15 years and have a daughter 17. No, huh? Well, uh, let's try it this way. I'm 15, I've been married 17 years, and I have a daughter 20. <laughs> now, now, even I can see through that one. <laughs> Why don't you tell me the truth, Mrs. Vandalette? Mrs. Vandalette? Oh, oh, yeah, that's me. Yes, and I'm Rudy Valley. Oh, how do you? How do you? Now, you, you have to forgive me. I'm terribly upset about you and my daughter. Emily's father should have come to see you. You know, he's a Yale man like you. Your husband went to Yale? No, no. Emily's father went to Yale. You've been married twice. Twice? No, only once. Isn't your husband your daughter's father? Uh, oh. 
Yes, I guess he should be, shouldn't he? <laughs> you know, he's beginning to sound more like a Harvard man. <laughs> It's Emily's father, and he's a Yale man. Well, I'm always interested in a fellow alumnus. Did your husband get a letter at Yale? Oh, sure. I wrote to him every week. <laughs> I mean a collegiate letter. Did he play football, basketball, tennis, etc.? Oh, yes, yes. He was captain of a etc. team. <laughs> the letters I wrote to him were very collegiate. I'm afraid you still don't understand what a Yale letter is. Well, what is it? Why? That's what I say. Who cares? Now, may I have your address? 360 North Camden. Thank you. I'll drop over and talk with your husband about this. You're too upset to make sense, but perhaps we Yale men can straighten this thing out. Oh, no, no. No, you, you mustn't talk to my husband. Why not? Uh, well, um, you see, he's even more upset than I am. He doesn't even remember going to Yale. How ghastly. <laughs> and it's all because of you and our daughter. You've just got to give her up. But I don't even know the girl. Oh, Mr. Valley, I'm serious about this. You can play dumb, but I'm not playing. <laughs> now, promise me you'll give her up. If it'll terminate this interview, I promise. Oh, good. And now that it's over, yeah, I, I just want to say that I, I don't blame Emily. You're, you really look very handsome and quite young, too. Thank you. But it's a funny thing. You looked younger when I first came in. I was younger. <laughs> I would say that your little visit has aged me about five years. Ah, yes, sweet. <laughs> well, goodbye, or as you Yale men say, anchors away. <laughs> watch out for girls. I will, and you watch out for squirrels. <laughs> what an experience. Oh, Wong. Why, yes, sir, please, Mr. Valley. Wong, I'm going over to 360 North Camden to rehabilitate an old Yale man. Worry over his young daughter has unseated his mind. He doesn't even remember going to Yale. Oh, how ghastly. <laughs> yes, my therapy should be to take him back to the good old days of New Haven. Fetch my raccoon coat, my Yale pennant and beanie. Lie away. You'll find them in my room where I took them off last night. belongs to Daddy. That Cole Porter classic reminds us that Father's Day is next Sunday, June 19th. That's the day you can show Dad just how much you really appreciate him. So pamper the man. Make him feel like a king in his own castle from breakfast on. And you can be sure Dad's heart will belong to you when he tastes that delicious, heartwarming coffee. Rich, mellow Maxwell House coffee. You know, only Maxwell House gives you such a satisfying good to the last drop flavor. And it's this superb flavor that's made Maxwell House America's favorite brand of coffee. That's right, Maxwell House is bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand of coffee at any price. How does Maxwell House create this superb flavor? Well, there's just one way. It's the blending of many choice coffees, premium varieties of highland-grown Latin American coffees, all carefully selected by our Maxwell House experts. First, they choose Bonazzale's coffees for mellowness. Next, metalums are added for richness. Still other fine coffees contribute vigor. And Bucaramangas round out the fine, full body.
This perfectly balanced Maxwell House blend is then radiant roasted to flavor perfection and brought to you vacuum packed in the familiar blue Maxwell House tin. And ladies, vacuum packing is especially important these days. For roasted coffee ground or in the whole bean loses flavor when it's packed in ordinary containers where air can easily reach it. But Maxwell House coffee is carefully vacuum packed so you get all the flavor and goodness you pay for. So friends, discover the extra flavor, the extra enjoyment of Maxwell House, the coffee that's always good to the last drop. And that's the first uh, segment of the Burns and Allen Show, uh, the Maxwell House Coffee Time program from June 14th of 1949. This is Chuck Shaden with our hall closet full of old-time radio shows on our Those Were the Days program every Saturday from 1 to 5 here on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Frigidaire Appliances, TV by Sony, Magnavox, and Quasar. Stereos by Sony and Magnavox. Videotape recorders, Corning Electric Ranges, Brown and Hardwick gas ranges. Shop no further. Townhouse TV and appliances has them all. Visit Townhouse and you'll be surprised at the selection and at the price. And that's not all. You'll get the Townhouse guarantee. Guaranteed delivery on the day promised. Guaranteed normal installation on all products delivered. Removal of your old appliance to the basement, to the garage, or off the premises. And Townhouse also guarantees to remove all cartons and packing material as well. Townhouse means service, and you'll get it at 7243 Tui Avenue, just west of Harlem. Townhouse TV and Appliances, open Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where plenty of free parking makes it a pleasure to shop your favorite store or service. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Womack. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. Easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Shop and save seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmette. Now let's get back to Burns and Allen. We now find Rudy Valley, complete with raccoon coat, beanie, and college pennant, arriving at the Burns home under the impression that he's going to rehabilitate an old Yale man whose mind is cracked. George sees him approach. Holy smoke, what's that coming up the wall? <laughs> it's Valley. I guess he is dating Emily. He's making himself for a college boy to do it. That guy is nuttier than a fruitcake. Come in. Bula bula. <laughs> bula bula. Break it again, squack, squack. Yay, yay, yay. What a nice cold glass of water. <laughs> Have I awakened anything? Yeah, the neighbors. Hold it down. <laughs> to the tables down at Maury's, to the place where Louis dwells, to the dear old temple bar we love so well. Mm -hmm. Sing the whipping folks assembled with their glasses raised on high. Mm -hmm. And the magic of their singing casts its spell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's get a load of this. Oh, whoa, 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 down in the garden where the red goes. <laughs> love you so. Love me like a flower. And don't you dare to holler. Come along, listen to the red goes. Red, red, red. <laughs> <laughs> Poor chap. This will take a bit of doing. What a crackpot. <laughs> Think back, old fellow. Can't you remember your school days? Yeah, a little. Back in old 98. 98, eh? That was a long time ago. Did you take part in any sports? I yeah, played a little pussycat and potsy. <laughs> they, must they must have discontinued those before I arrived. Have you any other recollections? There's a red-headed girl in my class. Used to dip her hair in the inkwell. They had girls there in your day? Well, sure. That I wish they hadn't discontinued. <laughs> you must have had jolly times at Yale. Yale? Yes, don't you remember? You're a son of old Eli. That old man's name was Sam. <laughs> well, I'm speaking of Yale University. Yale? Oh, back again, darling. 
Oh, Mr. Valley. Oh, well, my glad you're home. Mr. Vandalit here is in worse condition than I thought. Wait a minute. I'm not Mr. Vandalit. Oh, my husband thinks he's George Burns. What a horrible affliction. <laughs> you two whispering about? I'm George Burns. There, there, old man. Calm down. You'll get over it. Here, my driver's license. See for yourself. Hmm. Madam, this man is George Burns. Well, how do you do, Mr. Burns? I'm Mrs. Vandalet. <laughs> uh, look. Uh, where's your beautiful young wife, Gracie Allen? Is she gone? Real gone. <laughs> now, let's straighten this thing out, Rudy. I'm George Burns, and this is my wife, Gracie. If you pardon my saying so, you two strike me as both being rather peculiar. That's great, coming from a guy who's wearing a raccoon coat and a beanie. <laughs> well, just who is Emily Vanderlip? Well, she's a neighbor girl who's staying with us for a while while the folks are out of town. And she thinks you're the most fascinating man in the world, Rudy. Well, at least she's sane. <laughs> uh -oh. Here comes Emily home from school. Well, look through the window, Rudy. Do you recognize her as one of your girls? No, no. It's difficult to remember one among millions, you know. <laughs> Finding me here may send her into a frenzy of uncontrollable emotion. Where can I hide? Well, lie down on the floor and show your teeth. I'll tell her you're a raccoon rug. <laughs> Come in the den with me, Rudy. Yes, now I'll try to reason with Emily. Oh, Valley, Valley, why were you cursed with this fatal charm? Come on, Tables, Murray. Let's go. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Burns. Oh, Emily, I'm glad you're home from school. Oh, wait till I get up on a chair. Get up on a chair? Well, you're taller than I am, and I want to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with you. <laughs> what about Mrs. Burns? Well, about Rudy. Now, you've got to give him up. Give up Rudy? Why, I'd rather stop breathing. It's a bargain. Give him up, give him up, and I'll let you stop breathing. Now, what's wrong with him? Well, he's not the sort of person you should go with. Why, he has girls by the hundred, by the thousand. You mean he chases women? And catches them, too. <laughs> and another thing, if you marry him, you'll have to listen to him sing day and night. Oh, after we're married, he'll stop singing. Well, you know, if I was sure of that, I'd let you go through with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to anyway. I want Rudy to be the father of my children. Why, Emily, how many have you got? <laughs> Oh, forget him, Emily. Do you know how old Rudy is? Yes, he was 18 on Columbus Day. Well, there you are. That was in 1492. <laughs> now, that would make him about... Uh, uh, oh, my goodness. He's older than George. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Burns, have you ever seen Rudy? Well, sure. He's in the den with George right now. Oh, he is? Oh, gee. Now, now, come in. Hi, Gracie. Oh, hello, Emily. Oh, hello, Mr. Goodwin. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, I want to go to my room and get all prettied up for Rudy. Don't let him get away. Hey, Gracie, Emily got a new boyfriend? Yes, Bill. He's Rudy Valley. No fooling. I didn't know the old Silver Nose Tanner had a son. <laughs> this is old Silver Nose himself. Oh, you're kidding. Well, I'll show you. Oh, Rudy, George, come on out. Hello, Bill. Well, Bill Goodwin. Rudy, what's this about you dating Emily Vanderlip? Oh, Bill, I've never met the girl. As frequently happens, she has built a dream fantasy around Valley. Women of all ages find me the most irresistible of men. <laughs> Would you get the colossal conceit of this guy? How can he say that he's the most irresistible of men when he knows I am? <laughs> A couple, couple of shy kids. George, this gives me an idea. Bill, you take Emily away from Rudy, and George will take her away from you, and then I'll take George away from her, and she'll be back where she started. Bill, take a girl away from me with my Barrymore profile. Mm -hmm. You know, Rudy, you do look a little like Ethel. Uh. <laughs> But when you're merely jealous, because after a girl dates me, she never calls you again. Well, after she dates you, she can't call me. She hasn't got a nickel left. <laughs> Easy there, Goodwin. It's not safe to arouse the ire of an old Yale man. It is when he's as old as you are. <laughs> this is too much. Mrs. Burns, I need something to restore my composure. Could you fix me a cup of Maxwell House coffee? Well, I'll be glad to, Rudy. 
Hey, you, you drink Maxwell House coffee? Yes, and I warn you, Goodwin, ridiculing me is bad enough. But if you dare say one detrimental word about mellow, delicious Maxwell House coffee, I shall trounce you. But, but, really? Quiet. How could a note like you appreciate the consummate skill that goes into the making of Maxwell House, the way those superb Latin American coffees are expertly blended and then radiant roasted to the very peak of flavor perfection? Well, yeah, but Rudy... Silence! I... I'll have no aspersions cast upon Maxwell House. It's America's favorite brand of coffee, always good to the last drop. Now, have you anything less to say? Yes. I love you. <laughs> and George Burns... Shame on you for even suggesting that I could take a girl away from this fine, handsome, intelligent young college boy. Thank you. I didn't. I didn't suggest it. It was Gracie's idea. Why don't you ball her out? What? Ball out the boss? I want to work next season. <laughs> so long, Rudy. Yes? How do you do? I'm Rudolph, Emily's sweetheart. Not anymore. She's got a new sweetheart. What? Oh, but I, I, I'll tell her you're here. Uh, you say your name is Rudolph? Schreckenhorst. Watch your language, young man. <laughs> oh, Rudolph Schreckenhorst. Oh, oh. How could Emily have another sweetheart? She said she loved me. She was even going to take my name. Well, she must have loved you. <laughs> hey, maybe you're the one who can take her away from Rudy Valley. Come on in the den. Uh, boys, our problem may be solved. What have you dreamed up now? Well, this nice young man is going to take Emily away from you, Mr. Valley. Uh, that's right, sir. How do you do? This hobbledy hoy? <laughs> I'm not a hobbledy hoy. No, he's a Shrekken horse. <laughs> Gracie, this won't work. Oh, yes, it will. Valley won't have a chance against this boy. This is the final insult. Until this moment, I had no interest in Miss Vanderlip. But now I shall turn on every ounce of my magnetism and reduce her to a quivering mass of adoration. Well, do it outside. I just swept this floor. <laughs> it's too late. Here comes Emily. Mrs. Burns, did you tell me? Rudy, darling. She spies me. Her heart flutters. Emily... Let me kiss you, dream man. If you must. No, no, young lady, I'm over here. You're kissing the Schrecklehorst. <laughs> the magnetism, Rudy. Make it quiver. <laughs> ah, a bit of music will do it. I shall play my trump. Oh, I thought you played the sax. <laughs> I was referring to my incomparable voice. My time is your time. I wish Mr. Your Burns would stop that awful singing. No, it's not Mr. Burns. It's that other man. You mean the old creep with the megaphone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think his name is Rudy Valley. Never heard of him. Let's go, lover. Coming, honey, baby. Rudy, my time is your time. Look, uh, you can stop singing. Somebody just beat your time. <laughs> yes, Rudy. The second horse came in first. This is unbelievable. <laughs> I must be dreaming. Mrs. Burns, will you pinch me? Oh, no. Just because you lost Emily, you're not going to start a romance with me. <laughs> My time is your time. George and Gracie will return in just a moment. Here's Bill Goodwin. Housewives of America, Gracie Allen has proposed war. No, not on George. Gracie has declared war on home accidents. Almost 100 people are killed and nearly 3,000 injured every day in accidents in and about the home. That's why Gracie has formed the Don't Be a Gracie Club for Home Safety. Now, it's no fun to have an accident, but it can be fun to help prevent them. Write Gracie Allen today for free information on forming a chapter of the Don't Be a Gracie Club in your town. Lots of fun and a grand service to your community, too. Just address your letter to Gracie Allen, Hollywood Plaza Hotel, Hollywood, California. Join us again next Thursday when we'll all be back. George Burns, Gracie Allen, Bill Goodwin, Harry Lubin, and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Toby Reed. And now, here are our stars. We're a little late. Good night, folks. You like good things the easy way. Bill, 
Instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. Here's real instant coffee. All pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. Enjoy instant Maxwell House. Instantly. Good to the very last you know what. Until next Thursday, good night and good luck from the makers of Maxwell House. The George Burns and Gracie Allen Show was transcribed in Hollywood and written by Paul Henning and Keith Fowler. And now stay tuned in for the Kraft Music Hall, which follows immediately. That's Maxwell House Coffee Time from uh, June 14th of 1949, starring Gracie Allen and God. Right. <laughs> Not then, he wasn't, but in 1977 uh, and 78, a few years later, huh? George Burns, still going strong. Unbelievable man, isn't he? Unbelievable guy. This is Chuck Shaden here with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. You're invited to subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. The February issue will be in your hands by uh, the end of next week, and it features Henry Aldridge and Homer Brown on the cover, plus reprint articles about Fibber McGee and Molly, the cast of Radio's Gunsmoke, you'll see pictures of them, and Vic and Sade. There are original articles, too, about Jack Teagarden, science fiction movies, and the roots of Chicago radio broadcasting. 545-2260 is our number. And the newsletter is all yours when you get a one-year subscription. Ten issues for only $7. You can subscribe right now if you call us at 545-2260. 545-2260. You get the complete lineup of the good old shows we broadcast every Saturday afternoon, plus original broadcast dates and the length of each segment we program. And in addition to that, listing of our memory movies that you see every Saturday night at Northwest Federal. So give us a buzz at 545 545- 2260. Call us now. We'll get your subscription rolling right away. We'll include an invoice with your first issue, which, as I said, you'll get by the end of next week. If you like, you can send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But why not give us a call this afternoon? We'll be here for another almost 40 minutes at 545-2260. If the lines are busy when you call, if you would do, uh, do us the favor of waiting a moment and then calling back, We'll be glad to take care of you as quickly as possible. 545-2260. Now, we have a shadow program coming up in just about one minute, but to set the scene, we turn to Northwest Federal Savings. Who knows what interest grows from regular savings? Northwest Federal knows. <laughs> Northwest Federal Savings, that is. Northwest Federal Savings experts will clear up the clouds in your mind about confusing savings plans. Northwest Federal offers a wide variety of savings programs with interest from the day you leave it to the day you need it. You'll get prompt attention and clear, accurate information when you open your insured savings account at Northwest Federal Savings and remember... The seed of savings bears fruitful rewards. Regular saving pays. Northwest Federal knows. <laughs> Northwest Federal Savings, serving you 63 hours a week in Chicago on Irving Park Road, downtown on Randolph near Michigan, and in Edison Park, Des Plaines, Norridge, and Arlington Heights. Chuck Shaden here with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Turning back the clock now, quite a few years, 40 years, almost exactly 40 years to March 13th of 1938. It was a Sunday afternoon. Blue Coal was the sponsor. You were listening... Uh, perhaps on the floor in front of your big old Zenith radio, huh? Orson Welles was getting ready to go behind the microphone. Agnes Moorhead was standing by. The program, The Shadow. (laughs) The Shadow knows. (laughs) 
<laughs> Again, Blue Coal Dealers present radio's strangest adventurer, The Shadow. Mystery man who strikes terror into the very hearts of shops as lawbreakers and criminals. Today, Blue Coal brings you The Shadow's latest adventure, The Bride of Death. The Shadow begins his exciting adventure in just a moment. Meanwhile, I'd like to make a suggestion to all you homeowners. To protect your family's health and save real money in the bargain, burn Blue Coal. For Blue Coal gives you uniform, healthful, economical heat all winter long. Its harmless blue coloring is your guarantee of better heat at less cost. So when you're buying fuel, insist on Blue Coal. It's Pennsylvania's finest hard coal. Order a trial ton from your nearest Blue Coal dealer tomorrow. Come tomorrow. I must see her tonight. Why? My daughter, Isabel, is here. She's Mrs. Ackley's companion, but I've come to take her home. Ah, because Isabel, she does not wish to leave. I've come to fetch her. I'm a man of the cloth, a man of peace. But I will not leave without her. Let me by. Arthur, Matar, visitor, stop him. Yes, Master, at you command. Let go of me. Take your hands off me, you heathen devils. Put him out. Keep him out. Wait. Mrs. Ackley. I will see him. How dare you break into my house this way, Reverend Colby? Because I will not have my daughter stay in a house that harbors evildoers, Mrs. Ackley. There's talk in the village of heathen rites performed by this man who calls himself prophet of the ancient one. This man you've brought to a Christian place from some Asiatic sinkhole of the godless. Be careful how you speak in the presence of the prophet. You mean that man there? Yes, minister. I am the prophet. Prophet? Where is my daughter, Isabel? She is leaving this house on the cliff tonight. Tell Reverend Colby she does not wish to go. I... Tell him, Mrs. Ackley. Your daughter, Isabel, does not wish to go. Good night, Reverend Colby. I... I do not believe you. Let me see her. Let her tell me herself. She does not wish to see you. Get beyond the iron gates quickly, for in five minutes my servants will release my trained guardian. I'm not afraid of that unholy pack of black panthers of yours. They are dangerous, minister. Trained in my native land. Trained to hunt and kill animals or men. Go now. Very well. I'm going, but I'll be back. I'll be back. Stop it. Why? Why did the panthers scream? It is an omen of death. Who's death? Tell me. The future is so plain to you. Tell me who is going to die. I see the minister, Reverend Colby, standing in the pulpit of his church, turning the simple fishing folks against you, Mrs. Ackley. Reverend Colby is going to die. But how? The wrath of the Ancient One will strike him down with the voice of thunder and the tongue of fire. to Mrs. Ackley's house on the cliff to bring my own daughter, Isabel Colby, home. But I could not see her, could not speak to her. She is lost to me, and therefore let my own sorrow be a warning to those of you in this village whose sons and daughters may go to that house of the devil, to this man 
who dares desecrate the name of prophet. Amen. Now, let us offer a prayer for the mistress of Casamane. Though rich in worldly goods and worldly knowledge, and so long one of us, kindly and generous until of late, and now ailing in mind and spirit, who hath turned from God to follow the pathway of a disciple of Satan. Let us pray. <coughs> we beseech thee, have mercy on this poor lost one who has strayed from the fault. who perished with him and whom he loved so well. We return the body of our beloved minister, Reverend Colby. Return him to the earth, ashes unto ashes, dust unto dust. But where, Lamont? The fog's so thick I can't see a thing. This is the little village where the Reverend Colby and ten of his parishioners were killed by a mysterious explosion in his church. Oh, that was horrible. But, Lamont, it happened days ago. What can we do? Murder has been committed, Margot. Wholesale murder. And the killer or killers are still at large. But according to the newspaper report... Yes, I know. The paper said the authorities have been unable to uncover a possible motive. Investigation is hampered by the refusal of the fisher folk of this quaint little village to cooperate. Oh, perhaps they're afraid to talk, Lamont. Yes, it's surprising what superstition can do. What about this rich Mrs. Ackley you were talking about, Lamont? Where does she fit into the picture? I don't know, Margot. All I know is that about three months ago, she returned from the Far East with a man who calls himself the Prophet. This man claims to be the leader of a cult worshipping a deity known as the Ancient One. Is there such a cult? There was, but it was stamped out nearly five centuries ago because its ceremonies and rituals included human sacrifice. Human sacrifice? Yes. Oh, how horrible. Then you think there is a connection between this so-called prophet, the destruction of this Christian church, and the murder of Reverend Colby? Margot, I don't know. I'm going into that cottage down the road. I'm going to ask some questions. I'll wait in the car. Oh, that awful foghorn. It gives me the creep. You'll be safe here, Margot, but don't get out of the car. All right. Now, Lamont Cranston and the Shadow are going to find out something more about this mystery of the house. On the cliff. There. Yes? Oh, don't answer. Then why not, Marthy? You think it's a ghost from the marshes or that devil from the cliff house? There. Who's there? Don't open the door, sir. Stranger, I've lost my way in the fog. Well, tell him there's but one road back to the mainland. Well, leave this to me, Marthy. Where, uh, where are you heading for, stranger? Can you tell me how to get to Mrs. Ackley's place, Casamane? Yes, I could, but I won't. Wait, don't close the door. I'd like to ask a few questions. Uh, questions, eh? Well, ask them, but I'll not warrant an answer to anybody going to that house. You needn't be afraid of me. <laughs> I'm Captain Seth. Uh, Fifty years I've sailed before the mast, and I'm not afraid of man, devil of the sea. Uh, who be you? I'll tell you this much, Captain Seth. I'm yes. here to put an end to the thing that made your wife afraid to let you open this door. I can't see you out there in the dark, but... Uh, yes. Huh? Those Panthers, they've come down to the village again. What? Panthers? Who's are they? The prophets. Uh, step into the house, stranger. They'll tear a man to pieces. <laughs> well, what is your mercy? The blue light. It's him coming in the gate. He always carries it. It's him, the one that calls himself the prophet. Well, let him come. Get in the house, stranger. Well, Marthy, there's nobody here. Where is that fellow gone? He was here a second ago. Oh, I don't know. Maybe he'll run for it. Death. What do you suppose that prophet fellow wants of us? Get away from the door, Marthy. I'll deal with him. Good evening, my good captain. Stop where you be. I'll not have the likes of you in my house. A stranger came here. 
His car is down the road. The spirit of the ancient one told me of his coming. Who was this stranger? Where has he gone? To all your questions, I'll give you one answer. Get your howling beasts and your heathen godless self back to the house on the cliff, or I'll blow you to the very door of Hades. No man threatens the prophet and live. Get out! Very well, Captain. Since you will not tell me, I will find him. My servants are watching his car. We will find him. <laughs> He'll need all the unearthly powers you claim to find a man in this fog. Good night. I'll find him. He can't be far away. <laughs> no. Not far away, but close to you. In the dark shadows and the swirling mist. Who speaks? I am looking for a man with blood on his hands. The blood of a minister and ten innocent people he murdered. Are you a man hiding in the fog? Do not try so hard to pierce the fog. You cannot see me, for I am the shadow. The shadow? A voice without physical presence? Only a voice? No, my friend. In my native India, such things are known. But not here. The powers of mesmerism have spread beyond the gray monastic walls of the yogi priests. Modern science has advanced their ancient arts. Perhaps, but I am still stronger than you. Strong enough to do what I have set out to do. And what is that? I will not tell you, Shadow. And no one, not even you with your borrowed powers, shall stand in my way, for I, I am the prophet. Prophet of the ancient one. Master! Master of a stranger! He does not return to the automobile, but a young woman is there waiting for him. So! Could it be, Shadow, that you are the stranger we seek, that your companion waits for you? Daka! Yes, Master! Go quickly, I will follow. Seize the girl. She will be useful to us. Very useful. If I cannot reach the Shadow, I can reach his companion. Yes, Master! Matau and the Panthers, watch her! She will not escape! Do you hear, Shadow? Yes. I hear. Save her if you can. You say you are a man. If that is true, then my panthers will smell you out whether they can see you or not. There's the car. I can seize the girl. My car was a girl. My car was a girl. My car was a Take her to the house on the cliff. We will keep her with Isabel Colby. She shall be tortured until she tells us what she knows. At the beginning of this program, I made you a suggestion. To protect your family's health and save real money in the bargain, burn blue coal. Now, here's the reason for blue coal's superiority. This fine home fuel is selected Pennsylvania anthracite, an American product mined by the Glen Alden Coal Company. And anthracite supplies clean, uniform, healthful heat from cellar to attic, burned steadily, completely, down to a fine, powdery ash. So you see, Anthracite combines all of the essentials necessary for perfect heating results. What's more, anthracite is the fuel that furnaces, parlor stoves, and cooking ranges in this part of the country were especially designed to burn. And the cream of all anthracite is blue coal. No wonder it is the largest selling brand of solid fuel in America. No wonder blue coal sales in Auburn, New York this winter show a 15% increase over sales for the same period a year ago. Blue coal is especially prepared for home use. Every carload is laboratory tested for purity and uniform size before shipment from the mine. And every piece of blue coal is trademarked with an unmistakable blue tint so that you can identify it at a glance. So when you're buying fuel, take a tip from Auburn, New York homeowners. Ask for blue coal by name. You can get it in four popular home sizes, egg, stove, chestnut, and pea. Order a trial ton from your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. You'll find him listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. That's the first half of The Shadow and the Bride of Death from March 13th of 1938. Blue Coal commercials there. Boy, they're kind of interesting. America's finest anthracite. I had no idea that you could get coal in four different uh, shapes. You could jello is five flavors, coal is four different shapes. <laughs> Anybody out there remember coal? <laughs> used to, that's the stuff you used to have to shovel into your furnace 
after you took out all of the ashes and the clinkers and everything out of there, right? And then on a cold night, you had to bank the furnace properly. Of course, on this program, we say you had to savings and loan the furnace properly. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. At the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, 2924 Central Street in Evanston, they try their very best to find finer workmanship, finer leathers, and finer fit. At the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, they strive for quality, comfort, and reasonable prices, too, because they choose to care. And we hope you'll choose the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, 2924 Central Street in Evanston. That's where James Schufrieder and Matt Mason will do their best to fit you properly at the Paul Meyer Shoe Store. Well, there's another store in the news today, uh, or on the deck today. Our Metro Golden Memory Shop is having a special discount sale this month. You can save 10% or more on anything in our store. Visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop between now and the 31st of January. You'll find some good savings along with all the good memories. Everything in the shop is available for a 10% discount, and that means you can save 10% on the prices of records, cassettes, 8-track tapes, books, magazines, gifts, and novelties at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. There's some other very special things that you can uh, save some money on, too. Uh, nostalgia jigsaw puzzles are 25% off. You can save 50% on some uh, uh, small selection of Parker Brother games. You can save 50% uh, on those uh, electrical transcription discs and you can save uh, on a lot of other things. Too. Oh, we have some um, uh, special selection of old-time radio collects, almost custom recorded, not offered regularly as part of our Cassette of the Month series. These are 30-minute tapes. They're only $1 each, 6 for $5. And I know there are, there are uh, some um, Craft Music Hall in there and some Lone Ranger and I think some Shadow and some things like the Stan Freeberg, things that we don't usually offer. So you can... Um, uh, get them at the Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. We're open every day, Monday through Friday, 11 to 5.30, Saturday till 7.30, open tonight on your way to the Memory Movie, and Sunday afternoon from noon to 5. By the way, we'll be in the shop tomorrow afternoon to say hello and to help you pick out some good 10% discount items if you like. So come on over and say hi. Bank AmeriCard, Visa, and Master Charge are welcome at the Metro Golden Memory Shop. Don't forget to register for the drawing. We have 10 $10 MGM Shop gift certificates we'll be giving away on February 1st. And pick up your copy of our Nostalgia Party Planner at the MGM Shop. Now we go back to The Shadow. <laughs> House. I don't know. But who are you and why are they keeping you locked up in this room? Well, I'm Isabel Colby. My father was Reverend Colby, the minister of the little fishing village down the cove. He's dead. They've murdered him. Yes, I know. But you, why are you here? I used to be Mrs. Ackley's companion in Secretary. Before she brought this man, the prophet, to the house. But now, that Hindu has some sort of hold over her, over her mind. He calls her a high priestess. And she let him lock me up in here. Oh, how terrible, Miss Colby. What is happening in this house to Mrs. Ackley and to you? I don't know. It has something to do with a, a ceremony that the prophet says he and Mrs. Ackley must perform. The climax of some strange religious ritual they go through day after day in Mrs. Ackley's private chapel. He's changed it into, into a place he calls the Temple of the Ancient Ones. This morning, he came here and said, I am to be what he calls the Bride of Death. They're going to take me to that temple tonight. You know why? Yes, to kill me. Oh, no. Mrs. Ackley is the high priestess who's going to sacrifice me to that horrible deity they worship. <laughs> Don't give up hope, Isabel. Oh. There's still a chance we'll get out of this place, won't Oh, Lamont, Lamont, why didn't you come before? It's too late. Maybe this is... Arthur, unlock the door. Don't let me take me. Don't... Isabel Colby, the time has come. The high priestess is waiting to perform her ceremony. In the temple of the ancient. No, no. Masawa. Yes, Master. Take the girl Isabel to the shrine. Tell the high priestess to prepare the girl and herself for the wedding of death. Come. My master commands. No, no. I don't get your hand on the Jesus, thank God. Yes, Master. 
I kill her now? No. That's all right. Take the girl, Isabel, to the shrine. Wait there for me. Prepare the sacred fires. Purify the sword of the ancient one. The sacrificial altar is ready. And death is waiting for his bride. Yes, my No! No, you're going to murder me like you murdered my son! Now, strange girl, I will deal with you. <laughs> no, Prophet. You will deal with me. The shadow. Mr. Kevin, just come. You, the shadow here? How? There are panthers chained at every door. It was easy, Prophet. Oh, I knew the shadow would come. I knew he couldn't be far away. Oh, you do know the shadow. This slinking coward who fears to show himself. Who hides himself in the shadows. Shadow. The prophet is going to kill Reverend Corbett's daughter. He's going to make Mrs. Ackley kill her in some fantastic ceremony. Yes. In a few minutes, you will be dead and you cannot stop it. Clever scheme. You've numbed the failing mind of Mrs. Ackley with drugs. Made her do your will, sign a fortune over to you. Your knowledge will not help you now, Shadow. You plan to have Mrs. Ackley commit murder, turn her over to the police, blame her for the death of Reverend Colby, and with a fortune in your hands, discard your role of prophet and disappear. You are clever, Shadow. Yes, that is my plan. It is a pity such a mind as yours will soon be lost to the world. Within an hour, after Mrs. Ackley has obligingly murdered the girl Isabel, this house will burn. A tank of gasoline in the cellar will explode. And this will be the funeral pyre of the shadow and his beautiful young companion. But I must go now. They are waiting for me. <laughs> you are not going through that door. It is locked. You lie. It is. They cannot hear you. They're waiting for you in the temple, and I have the key to the door. You are not too clever, Shadow. Give me the key to the door, and I shoot this girl. Take that gun away from her head. Throw the key upon that table, quick. Don't give him the key. I'm not afraid of him. I shall count to three, Shadow. If I don't get the key, it's a pity. But this beautiful girl shall die. One. Two. Two. Three. Ah. You are wise. Shadow. You fiendish devil. I'll show you the shadow can do more than warn, threaten. Take that. Oh, Lamont. Oh, Lamont, are you all right? Yes, but I'm afraid I knocked the prophet out cold. Now, go take that key. Get out of here. Down the hall. There's a door. Take the prophet's gun. Drive to that cottage I visited tonight. Get Captain Zeth to call the villagers. Tell them they can help to avenge the murder of their friends. What are you going to do? Then they kill Isabel before I can get help. Never mind. You hurry and get help. All right. I'll go out. I'll get Captain Zest around with the people of the village, and then I'll come back. Very well, Margot. I may need your help. Come back to this room. I'll be back in a few minutes. Lamont. Lamont. Yes, Margot? I saw Captain Zest. The people of the village are coming. He's calling them together. You can't wait for him, Marco. Beyond that door, at the head of the stairs, death is waiting for Isabel Colby. The prophet's followers are there awaiting his appearance. But the prophet's still lying here, unconscious, on the floor. Nevertheless, he will not disappoint them. Lamont, I, I don't understand. Margo, I'm going to ask you to do a very dangerous thing. I want you to put on the prophet's robe, cover your face with a hood, and walk in there as the prophet. Oh, very well, I'll do anything I can. You know that. Do not show your face till you reach the altar. Don't speak. Keep close to Isabel Colby. Watch Mrs. Ackley and leave the rest to me. Yes, Your Honor. I understand. I'm ready. The altar of the ancient ones. The sacred fires burn in the jeweled torches. All is in readiness, master. All. 
As you have commanded, the tower, bring Mrs. Ackley. Prepare her to make the sacrifice. I, I am ready. Ready to do the will of the prophet to plunge the sword into the girl's heart. But I am afraid. Help me. Give me the sacred drug to give me strength. The will to do the things you have told me I must do if I am to be high priestess to the ancient one. Look, Matawa. It is strange. The master does not speak. Does not answer us. He goes to the shrine alone. Wait. He turns. He is lifting the hood of his robes. Akka, look. It is not the prophet. It is a beautiful girl. It is the strange girl. The one the master stayed below to question about the shadow. What has happened to our master? Why do you wear the robes of the prophet? Akka, Makawa, you have been tricked. The man you serve as a god is a rogue. A charlatan. A fake. That voice, Matawa. That is not the voice of the prophet. It is not the strange girl speaking. See, her lips have not moved. No. It is the voice of the shadow. The shadow. The master warned us to beware of the shadow, Akka. The tower. The master must be dead. The shadow has killed him. Drop it. The time has come. I must drive the sword into the heart of the bride of death. I will not fail. Don't do it. They're tricking you. Making you murder me. And they'll kill you. No. They'll kill you. No, I shall be a high priest. I shall live forever like the prophet. Like the ancient one. Mrs. Ackley. Mrs. Ackley. Drop that sword. Drop that sword, Mrs. Ackley. Drop it, I say. Drop the sword. Yes. Drop the sword. Oh. I can't. I can't look. This shadow has broken the master's power over this woman. I am free now. Free the spell. Oh, what have I done? He is stronger than the master. We must escape. We must get away. You will never get away. Never leave this house. Okay. The door. The prophet. The door is ready, my lord. Throw your knife. Kill her. Kill her, I command you. No. No, prophet. We obey you no more. Obey me. You take us. Make us kill. For you are the true prophet of the ancient one. You defy me. Stop. Drop the knife! See? The blood runs in his veins. He tells us he cannot die. Uh, now we shall see. The fall. Now. Now the shadow will destroy you. He is dead. The shadow spoke the truth, Matawa. He was not the true prophet. The true prophet of the ancient one was blessed with life. Everlasting. You are right, Arka. Quick, we must get away. Away from this shadow. You cannot escape for long. Your sins will find you out. Oh, Isabel! Isabel! Oh, oh, God. Be your safe. Thank you. You're Thank you for coming here. I'm sorry. But I'm afraid I must remain anonymous until my work is finished. I will have to continue being known only as the shadow. Now here is John Barclay, Blue Coal's heating expert, with a few words of heating advice for you. Thank you, Ken Roberts. Good evening, friends. During the month of March, when the weather is very changeable, a cold spell and a warm spell, some homeowners get the impression that they're economizing on fuel by putting only a little coal on the furnace fire during milder days. As a matter of fact, that is one of the surest ways to actually waste fuel. Shallow fires burn coal quickly, have a tendency to go out easily, can not deliver sufficient heat, and make repeated refueling necessary. The truly economical way to fire a furnace is to keep a deep fire bed at all times. It should always be up to a level with the bottom of the fire door. In mild weather, if you like, you can leave a little heavier layer of ash on the grate. This will keep the fire burning very slowly, yet keep enough coal burning to provide sufficient heat should the outside temperature drop suddenly. Let me impress you with this important point. After putting uh, fresh coal on the fire, 
be sure to leave an exposed spot of live coals directly in front of your fire door. The hot spot will act as a pilot light and ignite the gases that come up from fresh coal. Allow these gases to become ignited before checking the fire. If you follow this method of firing throughout the changeable March weather, you will get the utmost in efficiency and economy from your furnace. However, if you still have difficulty in properly heating your home, call your nearest blue coal dealer and ask him to send a John Barkley serviceman to inspect your furnace. This service is free to blue coal customers. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barclay. And friends, don't fail to take advantage of the free John Barclay service. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. You have just heard a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious, and a similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> As you sow evil, so shall you reap evil. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. Next week, same time, same station, Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite, will again present another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen, and be sure to burn Blue Coal, the solid fuel for solid comfort. That's The Shadow and the Bride of Death from March 13th of 1938, starring Orson Welles as The Shadow, with Agnes Moorhead as uh, Margot Lane. Now, um... Orson Welles, nine months later, would be producing the War of the Worlds broadcast on his Mercury Theater on the air in 1938, scaring the daylights out of half the country. A good show, The Shadow Knows. Chuck Shaden here with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago, FM 97. Don't touch that dial. We have a little bit of fun ahead of us. Yep. And a little message for you. Um, a program note here on uh, Tuesday evening, this coming Tuesday on Channel 2, uh, just January 24th and Channel 2 at 8.30 uh, for 90 minutes. The Kraft uh, Food Company is going to have its 75th anniversary special on with Milton Berle, Leslie Uggams, Bob Hope, Roy Clark, and lots of film clips. It's a very pleasant, nostalgic look at 75 years of uh, Kraft foods and uh, of entertainment. Uh, certainly the entertaining doesn't go back for 75 years, but there's some nice radio memories and some nice television memories in this particular program. Uh, Groucho Marx is on there, Bing Crosby, Perry Como, a lot of film clips. You'll see little Jack Benny, a beautiful thing with um, uh, Jimmy Durante on there. We had a chance to preview the program uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's a very nice show. And if you're going to be home on a Tuesday evening, next Tuesday, the 24th, Channel 2, WBBM Television, from 8.30 till 10, you want to see the Kraft 75th Anniversary Special. Then make a note or remind uh, yourself, we'll be talking about this later, on Sunday, February 12th, Kraft will sponsor a one-hour radio special entitled Kraft's Family Reunion. It'll be on uh, WBBM radio from 7 until 8, and it will feature excerpts from old radio shows sponsored by Kraft. Eddie Arnold and Ed Herlihy will be co-hosts for that program. And we'll be talking more about that as it gets closer to February 12th, but that's when that's going to be on CBS radio in Chicago from 7 until 8 o'clock. Now, don't forget tonight, we resume our memory movies over in the new auditorium at Northwest Federal Savings. Tonight, we have the 1930 comedy sensation Animal Crackers with the Marx Brothers. And uh, we have a little recording here of some fun from the Marx Brothers uh, uh, movies with Groucho. <laughs> Groucho Marx does his thing. One of the high points in every Marx Brothers movie are the songs, particularly when they are sung by Groucho. Here's a collector's item. The original, Hooray for Captain Spaulding. Hooray for Captain Spaulding, the African explorer. Did someone call me Snorra? Hooray, hooray, hooray. He ran into the jungle. Well, 
where all the monkeys throw nuts. If I stay here, I'll go nuts. <laughs> And that's Groucho Marx singing Hooray for Captain Spaulding. He sings that, and you'll see him sing it if you come to our memory movie tonight in the uh, new auditorium at Northwest Federal on Irving Park Road. This is Chuck Shaden, and this is our theme. And that was an on-the-air cue. That's it for today, gang. The old clock up on the studio wall says it's time to go for now. We'll be back again next Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5 with more nostalgic sounds. Next Saturday, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, Inner Sanctum. Our guest will be Jack Brickhouse. We'll have Raymond Scott on the orchestra, Pat Novak for hire with Jack Webb, Duffy's Tavern with Ed Gardner, and Boston Blackie in the case of the three-way split. Our thanks to Mort Paradise, Dennis Bubaz, Joel Bogart, and Gary Schroeder for their help behind the scenes. To our sponsors, Northwest Federal, Nelson Hirschberg, and Eden's Plaza for making this weekly get-together possible, and to you out there in Radio Land for making it worthwhile. This is Chuck Shaden speaking. Have a nice weekend. We'll see you tonight for the memory movie, or maybe even tomorrow afternoon at the MGM shop. And thanks for listening. You don't hear those on the air cues too often anymore. The time is 5 o'clock, and you're listening to WNIB in Chicago at 97 FM. This is Fred Heft speaking, inviting you to stay tuned now for Zephyr. Zephyr is our two-hour program of shorter, mostly lighter classical music presented each day of the week on WNIB between 5 and 7. In our first hour, Scandinavian music tonight by Grieg, Zinding, and Alvin. Then between 6 and 7, music by Dvorak, Catalani, Chilea, and Elgar. Edvard Grieg's Norwegian Dances to begin today. Norwegian Dances, Opus 35. There are four of them, and here they are, played by the English Chamber Orchestra, Raymond Leppard conducting. <laughs> 